What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Sean. And I'm Corey. And that shit did not change. <laughs> <laughs> Say I'm Corey again. <laughs> I'm Corey. And this is No Labels Necessary. We are in the building. Episode number seven. seven. Yes, he is correct. Episode number seven. And we appreciate y'all once again. One thing I got to say, though, is I didn't really see any love for the better audio that we have. We saw a lot of feedback for that bad audio. Y'all got at least let us know, hey, man, it's a little bit better now. At least I know it's not perfect, maybe. We're not Joe Rogan podcast audio quality, probably. But at least say, y'all y'all moving in the right direction, okay? Yeah, well, at least in all of it. Like, exactly. Say something. Exactly. Give, <laughs> give us some love, all right? Now, we got a lot of dope topics for y'all. If y'all are new mm-hmm. to this thing, just to remind y'all who we are, give y'all a little bit of that background. Uh, hey, both of us are in the music industry. We have a, a, a agency, Contra Brand Music Agency, where we help indie artists, major label artists. So a lot of the things we talk about, obviously, are music related. But really, the things that we speak to are oftentimes just content creator centric, period. You build it on any platform because artists and culture are synonymous these days when it comes to social media, which brings me to the first topic though because there's been a change of guards over the last i don't know let's just say thousands of years uh <laughs> well, probably more like a couple of hundred years because old artists are still getting to the bag and when i say old artists i do mean old old artists <laughs> yes yes that is a fact check out this stat right here i think artists y'all will find this interesting man um, this is a list of composers, right? How much would composers earn today on Spotify based off of numbers that I believe they're still seeing in their activity? That's Did you get a chance to look into that? That's, yeah. that's about right, right? Yeah, that's based off like rough estimate of current stuff. Right, current yeah. things that are actually happening today, right? So you got Johan Bach. You know, usually we just go off the last names back then. Two hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars. Well, two hundred sixty-seven thousand eight hundred seventy-eight dollars off of Spotify a year, twenty-two k a month. Beethoven will be getting two hundred thirty-six k. Wolfgang or Mozart. Damn, I don't even recognize some of these names <laughs> when I when I when I say it like that. Two hundred thirty-five k. Now, when we go way deep, I don't even recognize some of these classical artists. I'm not gonna lie, but we all know the top three. So. Keep that. There's actually a couple lessons that I think comes from that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> a couple lessons. But the first lesson I think that this talks about is, I mean, longevity. When your when mm-hmm. your audience, there, bro. When, when they last, boy, they last, bro. Yeah, bro you've had literally <laughs> centuries to build your fan base, and you know when your music is kind of seen as like a, a cultural apex, right? Like classical music kind of has that. Mm. Sticking with being for a certain demographic of people, a certain caliber of a person, right? And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. So, yeah, I, I like that. I, I, I like wish that. there was a way to like one to see how much money they were making back then, and then compare it to right, would it be paid I more today more. or pay I less? Bet you I feel more, like bro. it had to it be has more because yeah. they were getting funded by people back then. Yeah, exactly, yeah, bro. And most economy. of them music didn't pop off until they died. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. lots of them were like the definition of a struggling artist. Like I know we talk about. The struggle artists today, but no, they were truly struggling yes. artists. You know, and like you yes. said, unless they were funded by some some high end wealthy person or something. But I would love to just get that comparison, like what was Beethoven making back then? You know, what I'm saying what was what were you, you know? Sure, man. Do the do a quick little Google on your phone real quick. Look that up. But while, while we while Jacory does that, like Jacory said though, it, like we talk about a fan base lasting, right? So we already talk about we might as well in some ways work this in. 21 Savage saying that Nas, <laughs> that Nas isn't relevant, except for the fact he just got a strong fan base and good music. That right there sounds like a straight troll. I'm like, I can't believe that there's so so much hypocrisy in that statement. You know, you're not relevant, but you got a strong fan base, a loyal fan base, and yeah. actually a good music. But we hear that lasting value. We see somebody like Nas, who would probably be what 25 to 30 years in now, some somewhere, yeah, somewhere in that there. range. Yeah. Right. And then you go hundreds of years. So what does lasting look like? And I think when we talk about, let's say Nas, right? Something that's more achievable and what most artists are thinking about. Lasting throughout your lifetime, 
that means making that really powerful connection with that set of people, mm -hmm. whoever that set of people is, right? And then, of course, you can vary the size of that, but making a real impact and connection with those people and continuing to remain relevant with them, right? But you touched on something that I think creates extra lasting value that never really gets talked about, where you said the classical artist, that genre in general, mm -hmm. really, right? is a cultural apex, right? Mm -hmm. It's symbolic with a certain culture. So it makes me think, are there ways that artists in modern times can make themselves synonymous with pockets of culture so they can last, you know? Like, what do you think about that? That's a good question. I, I, I think it's easier for more niche artists to do, mm. right? So we, the last part we talked about, like the, the Jersey club house artist. If you're a person, that's listening to that type of music where most of those artists don't get to be big or mainstream, then there are probably going to be people in there that are the apex of that culture because that that music scene as a whole isn't is like massive, right? Or hasn't right. gotten it yet. Versus pop, right? Who can become the apex of pop music when there are so many massive pop artists, right? Is it going to be Taylor Swift? It's going to be The Weeknd? Is it going to be... Nah. nah. Nobody after Michael, really. Yeah, right? exactly. Right, yeah. So I think it's much harder to do currently in the more mainstream genres but the subcategory genres that come up that just pop up like randomly every couple of months or so i think for those people it's a, it's a bit easier because mm. we've seen what happens when niche cultures get a strong like foothold and they last like they create these massive pockets of, of of fans and artists that go under the radar but then if you learn about it and you know you're like, oh, shit, this is way bigger than I, I thought it was, right? Right, right. And then, so I think in that world, yes, pop culturally or mainstream, probably not. I can't see it. I could see that because in that smaller pocket, right, there's always this idea of respect, mm -hmm. right? Like, if you're into this genre, this isn't one of those fly-by-night, no pop shit, no yeah. superficial shit. So you shit. know, you gotta know. You gotta know, yeah. right? And you gotta respect, basically... You know the four founders or who four forefathers or whoever looked at at the, at the peak of that specific genre. So that makes sense. I can see that, and I think there's also an opportunity to be symbolic in ways beyond music itself, but still do it through your music. Mm -hmm. All right. Now this is obviously a little bit older, but if you look at Bob Marley, all right, his music 100% did well in its time, mm -hmm. right for what it was relatively. He wasn't the biggest artist in the world per se, but the music alone was doing well. And then at some point there came a turn in his career where there was the, you know, freedom fighting mm -hmm. that came along and his music, right? And him himself became yeah, symbolic, symbolic yeah. of an entire movement, right? And you can go all around the world. Like I remember being in Brazil and <laughs> This uh, dude I I was out there with, man. Shout out to Braj Braj uh, Jabril. I ain't seen you in a minute, man. But um, everybody would be like, Bob Marley, Bob Marley, whatever yeah. they saw him, bro. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 it kind of, sort of, but not really, you know what I mean? One of those type of things. He had the beard and, and, and the locks and everything. So, uh, he has that face card, though, right? And when you think about it, and it's not till you really travel a lot of times, you start thinking about what, like worldwide recognition recognition really is like yeah right like there's only a select few when you get into what bob marley michael jackson michael jordan muhammad ali and you have people like in the modern day beyonce and kanye yeah. right have that um but i think beyonce is probably more limp even Kanye, both of them are a little bit more limited. It was funny. I was in a, in the comment section the other day of um, some random video. I don't even remember. But someone was talking about how wherever he's from, like no one really knows who Kanye is, mm -hmm. which was in it. It's somewhere. I think it was in South America or whatever. But he was just like, yeah, like like people making a big deal. Like, oh, how can you not know who Kanye is? Like, it's a mm -hmm. lot of people who don't know who Kanye is, which is like hard to imagine. Yeah. Right coming from America. And I think I remember my uncle, I believe, I think it was my uncle who was telling me about that. Somebody I know had a friend that um, got some money and they're in one of these spaces and places that Oprah 
is around and for whatever reason Kanye was there on that occasion too and he was like pretty upset right because some lady didn't like know who he was yeah. or whatever yeah. so it's the thing right like no yeah. matter how big you think right and the world the, will humble you the world will <laughs> humble you it's a lot of people out there and everybody <laughs> doesn't have time right yeah every like you know there's presidents of nations and and, and or kings and stuff that i don't know you yeah. know what i mean like yeah. what you a king or what like yeah. so you're just a normal person to me yeah. right so i think this like bring it around it's interesting that one that we're in this age where you can still take advantage of pockets and create lasting value, but it's very unlikely to be on the scale that it used to be able to be yeah. on, right? Yeah. But at the same time, those small pockets have become bigger pockets, right? So for artists who are like, yo, I don't want to be pop, but I want to be whatever your version of indie and your specific category is, it's no longer not feasible to make a lot of money in a lot of these different um sub genres and, and lifestyles it's like because yeah. now it's like you it's not just about those people in your state or your country you can reach those people across the world and it actually adds up to a decent amount of income a lifestyle and people yeah yeah and it's like pretty much we're not going to see as many massive superstars but we're going to see a lot more successful artists mm. which i also think is going to make yeah becoming a massive superstar even more coveted and wanted by artists yeah, you know, oh yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. The goalpost changes like every five years, right? Like, everybody wants to be. I just want to be a successful artist. Like when they got the chance to do it. It's like when well, I want to be famous. Like uh, now, you now you're asking for something that's much yeah. harder to do. Yeah, um, than it is then. But I mean, I, it, I think we talk about once, right? Like, the middle class of artists is going to grow. Mm -hmm. I mean, by default, the lower class is going to grow as well because more people are going to see the middle class and the upper class. I'm like, oh, that's just easy. Let me get in on that. You know what I'm saying? Cheaper to get in, but I do think that's the cool thing about it. Is, yeah, you know, going back to even like the classical artist conversation. I mean, I think it's easier to become the face of a cultural movement when there are less of you fighting for that spot, right? Which is the benefit that any artist really pre, I would argue, probably modern radio had the benefit of, right? Like you were a big fish in a, in a, in a pond with nobody else in it. Or, <laughs> right. or a, a pond of people that we didn't know even existed. Right. And, you know, so we go back to that thousands of years ago. First ones to, to kind of do it, you know, so maybe not the first ones to do it, but the first of their kind kind of doing it right. And then we're learning about them. They became a culture of movements. And I don't, I can't think of any modern day superstar classical artist. So that, nah. I don't know if you remember, I had this mentor that um, dominated the jazz charts. Oh, yeah, yeah, Because yeah, of that, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah. he told me he hopped into jazz because he's like, jazz is so underserved right now. There's no superstar jazz artists. Like, all the big superstars are, artists from decades ago so if you come in you get one two good jazz songs like you can easily shot to, shoot to the top of the charts and that's exactly what he did he came in <laughs> produced one or two you know what i'm saying good songs and shot to the top and then he can say he's a billboard charting jazz artist right Man. and so i look at it the same way with classical music like if most of the people that dominate classical music are artists that, have, that we've known about forever you know and for, for, for forever part of our lifetime who's coming on to take that spot probably a hard thing to take because of that exact thing this is the apex of it that we've all been taught you're not getting any bigger than Mozart. You're not getting any bigger than, than Chopin and <laughs> Tchaikovsky, however you say his name. You know what I'm saying? But so they get a they get, ghost, man. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy, bro. Exactly, bro. You were literally fighting ghosts, <laughs> fighting dead people. And I look, I found it too. So apparently, uh, Mozart was making, or uh, Beethoven was making four thousand florins a year, which uh, comes out to about a hundred thousand dollars in today's currency. He was making like hundred k a year. It's not, it's not as bad as I thought. Yeah, me either. He was, was doing decent. Yeah, bro. He was all day. You know, he's like. High value man, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> he was up there. <laughs> uh, hey, sh shout out to Mozart, bro. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I mean that that's that's really interesting because you like want to transition to this advice. This rare, this we got a really dope step for y'all, and it's gonna change how you approach your content going forward. Period. Mm -hmm. But before I get to that, what you just said is it makes me think about you have these genres. If you happen to be listening to this and you're a classical artist, I'm surprised, <laughs> but we appreciate it. Or you're in opera, or you're one. in jazz. I know we got somebody in jazz. Yeah. Applying modern marketing techniques. Hey, that's that's the way to go because most of y'all's genres are behind and so orthodox 
that somebody just has to break the mold and like bite the bullet, be a little bit disliked by the old guard and get some, you know, hey, get some money, get some money, <laughs> right? Get some people who actually aren't as purist to that genre to show you love. And now you go commercial and you'll probably be the one, right? Mm-hmm. At the moment, because especially things like that, those type of genres, it's hard to see a, a complete re renaissance, right? Mm. Or a reawakening where it's like, oh, yeah, this jazz artist has popped out and now he's going crazy. And all of a sudden now there's four or five more. It's harder. It might create a generation that then thereafter like re um, innovates. But... Yeah, you're not going to see like all of a sudden three jazz artists pop up at the same time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Partially because of marketing and how people exploit shit. Right. And what I mean by that is let's just imagine you got some jazz artists pop out of nowhere or a classical artist. Let's go with a classical artist. He pops up and for whatever reason, he's commercially cool. He gets that. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen? Everybody's going to start doing collaborations with that person. Yeah. Right, they're gonna want that. They're gonna want the number one. It's the value of being considered number one. People want to use your equity and seem cool because you're of the moment, and that's not really gonna give much chance to the rest of them mm-hmm. to hit that level. All right, you might have some people who now open their ears more up uh, to the genre or that music style. So mm-hmm. you'll still see an increase in listens in that space, but. It'll be a big wealth gap. Let's say that. Yeah. You know, 100%. wealth of attention. Yeah. You know, uh, let alone money and all the and streams and all that other stuff. Yes, hundred percent. Like something like that would, like you said, more so be setting up the next generation of classical <laughs> artists. <laughs> Give me, hey, you know, you guys here now. Hey. Now y'all still probably kind of ass out, but yo, the next ones in 10, hey. 15 years, that's gonna be great. You know, same way with rap, right? It's like how all the old rappers were basically martyrs for rappers today. You know what I'm saying? Hey. They had to walk. So a little baby could fly, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just the, the way of the game. <laughs> hey, that that is. That is. Now, with that being said, I got a stat for y'all. Like I said, it, I'm telling you, it should change how you approach and think about your music and your marketing, particularly from a content standpoint. So I don't even want to just say music marketing, just content, period. Mm-hmm. All right. This stat says, and Todd B. Uh, Hitsman on on t- uh, Twitter. He was the one who shared this. Y'all can look him up and get a little bit more information on his background, but he's a legit person. He said, 59% of Gen Z watches longer versions of videos that they discover on short form video apps. All right? Let me repeat that. 59% of Gen Z, that's a lot. Ten, almost not 10% more than half, watch longer videos all right, so we think they don't have the attention span, but they do watch the longer videos, but it's after they discover them on short form video apps. You know, what are the chances that it's TikTok? Mostly, we know mostly that's TikTok, <laughs> right? And then, of course, you're getting some some reels. So what does this mean? It means your short form is promo for the long form, mm-hmm. period. It's gateway. Right, it is the gateway. And that was why we started to go hard on TikTok so early because we saw it transferring over to platforms and we couldn't fully prove it. It's now been proven out more and more um, where we we started to like hypothesize. Like we think one of the reasons that this is happening is just because, hey, I really like you, mm-hmm. but I want more of you and I can't consume all of you in the short term format. Yeah. Period. Like I go somewhere else. Gotta go somewhere else. All right. We know TikTok is trying to create more space for long form on the platform but still i don't imagine it getting to an hour like a youtube video could be i don't really imagine text becoming significant not text well actually yeah even even text becoming significant in a way you can with a tweet or Mm. uh you know your music's not going to be on there in the same capacity and we know that photos aren't going to be as integral as instagram right Yeah. yeah so with all that being said Right. TikTok obviously is great. Reels is great. But even shorts on YouTube, all of these things are great in their tools. You just have to keep it in mind and understand that for whatever you're trying to get seen. Like I like the way I look at it. People need to get really good and not only taking snippets right from their short, their long form content and creating short form content of it. Mm. We got that. But contextually people are going to have to get good at creating short form content 
specifically to promote yeah. the long form content, not yeah. just a snippet, right? Like, oh, here's the hook. I'm going to say a massive stat or whatever, right? And then give you a little bit of information about that stat. Well, I'll say, oh, 59% of, no, no, know what? I actually flip it, right? This is going to completely change how you approach your content forever. Did you know that 59% of Gen Z watch longer versions of videos that they discover on short form apps? Well, if you don't know how to make that happen, watch this format and da da da, right? Yep. And then they go watch a long form video, right? Yeah. That's what everybody's going to have to start doing. So it's almost like recording. I'm going to do my music video and then I'm going to record a high quality planned out mini music video to yeah. promote the music video and it might not even be in the actual music video when you get there yeah it's gonna be interesting to see that that's gonna be an art within itself yeah and it's already kind of getting there um for the ones that kind of know and it makes sense too i look at it as the short form clip is pretty much how you break the trust barrier yep and people are more which is interesting though, but people are more likely to be won over by the short information and the long information, which is, which is was weird. It's <laughs> kind of saying it out loud, like as I said it. Yeah. But I get it because I fall into the same trap. Like I, I, the example I always give the um, artists is, you know, it's like somebody knocking on your door and asking you to read a book versus reading like a page of the book, right? Like you're yeah. way more likely to you. The person I'm talking about, like, witness. Yeah, exactly. I, I want to say that, but that's basically like somebody, that's exactly that's somebody. exactly what I see in my head when I say that example every time. But I don't want to say it because you never know. You know what I'm saying? You never know who you're talking to. But if that person knocked on the door, is like, "Yo, hey, Sean, I got this book for you. You know, read read this whole chapter." You're like, "Hell no." If that was like, "Yo, read this page," you might you might you might indulge them, right? And then you might get into the book like, "Oh, this shit hard. How much you want for it?" Maybe. So I look. <laughs> What book we talking about, girl? <laughs> uh, Gary V. Jab Jab Right Hook. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that would be wild, bro. Hey, look, I wouldn't even put it past Gary V. Brother. <laughs> oh, to hire some shit like that? That shit would be. Hey. Wow. That would be crazy, bro. Hey, door to door. Book salesman? Create, hey. And create a campaign around that? That might be hard. That actually that actually could be hard. But actually, I was thinking about trying to figure out how to hire Jehovah Witnesses specifically. <laughs> well, like, hey, man, just take your. Just put this shirt on when you're on my time, man. Just switch it out. <laughs> Start talking about I mean, my... already trained for the cause, though. Exactly, it's bro. It's hard to train up a regular person. Like, most people don't have the, the wherewithal to sustain closed doors and yeah. attitudes and going through a hood <laughs> that might not be safe, you know? So, yeah, bro. But I have a cousin. Uh, I mean, he's a little cousin. He's probably like four or five years younger than me. But growing up, his mom was a Jehovah Witness. And he used to make him do it with him, her every weekend. Word. And funny enough... He is a great salesperson today. See? You know what I'm saying? He's already got the, the shell for rejection. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> built up. He knows how to get. I'm like, you can get somebody, if you can get somebody to open the door or keep the door open for longer than two minutes, but you're already doing good. You know what I'm saying? Because I give them max 15 seconds. Facts. Like, yeah. hey, man, what you got? Oh, no, nah, man, I'm good. <laughs> 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 My bad, man. The baby in the back crying, man. I'll be back. Oh, you oh, not that I'll be back and never come back. Never, bro. Just lock the door. And the fake baby, bro. You know what I'm saying? They don't know my life. The fake baby? Yeah, they don't know my life. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> uh, all right, so. <laughs> but, you, but that shit. Go ahead. And I'm actually glad we're into this because now we can finally talk about something that we've talked about in private for a long time but never really had a space to say. What? But the obvious war between TikTok and YouTube. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bro. They've been yeah, yeah, yeah. Like everyone thinks it's TikTok v Instagram. Nah, bro, it's TikTok nah. versus YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> but it's been it's so funny because it's been TikTok versus Instagram since the very beginning in people's mind. Mm -hmm. But I remember, remember, I had that video where I was like, it's not TikTok versus Instagram. It's TikTok versus Spotify at the very beginning. Like y'all need to be looking at using it as a streaming and promotional platform. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know Instagram. Is a part of that, right? Everybody's taking a little bit from everybody, but it's it's like they're so far behind. I don't know. It's almost like TikTok doesn't seem to be taking Instagram seriously. Yeah, they're okay. not looking at them. They're they're competing directly. Yes, they went. All right, we're going to figure out how we can leverage and get power over the DSPs and the labels, and then on the other side, we're going for YouTube, which is funny enough when you think about it. It is. The biggest major label, right, for content creators. My YouTube? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you want to think about it that yeah. way, right? So we're going to attack the music creators 
at those and, and deal with those music uh and the music labels and then we're gonna go with the general content creators and who's their music label youtube because mm-hmm. instagram doesn't really own people like that yeah I've, I, like you said none of them take instagram seriously because at this point instagram doesn't really innovate they copy so they know that yeah Instagram isn't gonna become a serious problem unless we come up with something that makes them a serious <laughs> a serious problem. And Instagram is really the best explanation I've heard of modern day Instagram is it is a combination between LinkedIn and Tumblr, right? So you kind of have like the mm. the the people still care about images on that the same way it kind of was on Tumblr, and like now it's more of a branding tool than really. Well, no, I mean, Instagram is like the biggest dating app, which still to me ties back into the whole branding thing right it's a platform right. for you to showcase yourself nobody's still in instagram features like the closest we got was maybe when the other platforms started taking stories and i don't remember if instagram had stories first because they actually know i think about might have been just them taking from snapchat if i really right really think about it right so yeah they're not known for being innovative and doing anything so i don't think any of the platforms view them as a real threat by the time you come up with something it's gonna be a rehash of some shit we already did and we already onto some new shit Right. Yeah, the, <laughs> but the TikTok That's YouTube crazy. thing, because we've seen it for a minute, right? Like, like, like you said, like it, it was the obvious answer was just TikTok versus Instagram because Instagram had reels, but people missed when TikTok started um, started trying to figure out how to optimize their, their search engine presence a lot better, right? right? Like they took they got real the Discover tab started slowly pushing us towards being more comfortable with the search button. Yep. And then once they got us there, now it's like, oh, you can actually find videos, categorize. I don't know if you noticed it, but then when you search things on TikTok, if you look underneath, they give you like other categories of, of videos that might be related to what you're searching for to kind of go through and look for stuff like that, right? So that was the first tip, because it was like, man, why does TikTok care about building a search engine? You know what I'm saying? Optimizing the search engine, right. no other platform seems to care about that except for YouTube, hey. right? Second thing that made me think about it, was we've been talking about how hard they've been going with lives recently. And, right. you know, at least over the last two months or so. And, I mean, up until recently, the two biggest live streaming platforms have been YouTube and Twitch. Twitch, to me, is kind of in their own lane. Nobody really seems like they want to, like... Like, Twitch seems like the cool, like, big brother, right? Like, right. it's like, oh, we're not really going <laughs> to mess with them. You know what I'm saying? They're doing their thing. They're yeah. in a different space. But we're going to take things here and there. So it really still goes back TikTok versus YouTube and YouTube make shorts, right? They hop in the game. Like, okay, we're going to attack them at their own game. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we're going to pull one of their features, try to integrate it into here. And then I know the topic we're about to get into is going to break it down even more. On, yeah, we might as well skip to that beat. one. Yeah, yeah the beat. Yeah. But it's like, the, the the signs are there, bro. It's TikTok v. YouTube, bro. Like, it's, they fighting for the top spot for, for, for creators, bro. Man, <laughs> that, it's funny because, you know, when we were thinking about TikTok with a YouTube compare with a Instagram comparison, it was very obvious that TikTok is paying far more attention to creators than, than Instagram ever had. Hundred percent, yeah, right? Hundred percent. Instagram was kind of like you're using us, yeah, and that's it. And TikTok, you know, the PR or not, right? <laughs> we care about the creators. Yeah. Monetization funds came quickly. Um, all types of opportunities in terms of like taking some of the bigger creators and connecting them with uh, brand partnerships mm-hmm. and being a liaison. Like they are almost in control of the full marketing stack. It's, they don't own the creators yet, right? Yeah. <laughs> they don't own the artists yet, but they are highly invested in helping them. Mm-hmm. Like we, we already know a campaign that we're running right now for an artist. He has TikTok team, helping him mm-hmm. he has the sound on team helping him that tiktok owns yeah right and like and that's free type of stuff yeah all right that's completely free then i could think about another artist uh remember i was telling you he said that if he hit certain measurements tiktok told him that they're going to put money up on him oh yeah okay that, that he wouldn't have to pay back yeah right you're talking about, I'm just going to make up a number here, but it is like a, a, a significant am, amount of money. But let's just say if you build momentum on your song and you get it to a thousand videos, all right, cool. We might help you a little bit here, but it starts building momentum. You're hitting 10,000 videos and you're a part of this process. They already have their eye on you. You're talking about the possibility of them putting 10K Right into your campaign mm-hmm. behind your song that you're not gonna have to pay back. Yeah, not gonna have to pay back. Now, why is that? I'm not 
sure this would last forever. Maybe they go deeper and deeper and offer bigger and bigger deals. Maybe, maybe. But one, you have to be on sound on for this, by the mm-hmm. way. Yep. Um, so there promo, is that promo tactic. Right. right. <laughs> it's a promo tactic to help you get on sound sound on Two, I believe on sound on. They do have a percentage of your royalty similar similar to uh, United Masters, where they might get like ten percent. So it's a free platform to use, mm. but it's ten percent of the royalties from that, something like that. So if you have that, they see your song moving, they're going to get that money back anyway. So they can look at that as an investment, right? And then three, they're really trying to establish proof of concept. Mm-hmm. They know that. You know, we've created stars at this, at this moment already. There's been multiple artists who have popped and have legitimate careers. I know a lot of people say, oh, who's still being listened to or what artist has lasted? Bro, there's plenty of them. Like, if you have that mentality, you just haven't done your research and mm-hmm. you're just being bitter. But they know they've done that. But for whatever reason, it seems that TikTok's invested in creating more of it. Like, they have to prove themselves. I, I'm not quite sure what they're trying to prove in that regard like maybe they want them to be indian stay indie or they want to be more a part of it along the way so yeah. they can build their own proof of systems of i think it's that one you know like a hit making machine yeah, i think it's that one you think that's what it yeah, is i think that they want people to not think it's so sporadic and uncontrollable mm. and be like hey you know we have a like you said a system of funnel that we can push people to if you hit some certain metrics and we can get you there which we, we know they could yeah and also think they just want a piece of it bro like imagine being the machine funneling hundreds of millions of dollars of people and not getting any of it even if you're just a distributor like you said just getting 10 percent that's better than nothing you know what i'm saying I mean, look, bro, yeah. people have done that for years. Yeah, that's, yeah, facts. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just, <laughs> well, it's not unheard of. I mean, I get it, though. At the same time, the tech just enables it, and now they see a new route. But it's like, hey, shoot, MTV didn't have any stake in the artist's money. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> or the TV in general, like that entire system, creating stars, creating stars without that type of stake. You know, there's some of those people who had their hand in both ends from the back end, like some of those owners, but that's a whole different game. Yeah. So... It's been it's, it's not <laughs> it's not like you can't not put your hands in the cookie jar, yeah. but at the same time I get it. Like, shit, why not? Yeah, Especially we're we talking about unprecedented data, bro. Mm-hmm. They're on your platform, blowing up all of their data. Period of everything that they do, damn near. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's other platforms, but just in terms of what happens on there, the the crazy amounts of data, people promoting your song thousands of videos hundreds of thousands of videos done to your song they saw every single post you did up to that what your fan base looks like to a t they mm. have all this shit and then you got your music on our distribution platform so we see the motion the momentum it's all like why not and tiktok and one thing i do appreciate about tiktok is they're the only platform that will admit that if they like some shit they are going to inflate it Facts. in their power. Bruh. They've admitted that. And, I, yes. I, and so we know that if they, if you're probably, if you're a sound on artist and you're getting some momentum, they're going to, they're going to help you out. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. We look outside just the money. They're, they're going to help you out. So I'm not aware if people in general are aware that they admitted that, mm. but I can say, remember early on, we were speculating. It, yeah. Right. Before, it wasn't even just music artists. It's just like, we'll talk to somebody. <laughs> it's so funny because you'll like be talking to like an influencer or somebody who was high at the time. This is like still in 2019. And they'll be like, man, it, it just felt like all my shit just started popping out of nowhere. And then it just stopped. Like, and it was, it almost literally sounded like TikTok came and picked me up, right? Yeah. And flew me away. And then they just, like, dropped me off, bro. Like, I kind of, like, I used, you know what I mean? Damn. Like, you ain't going to give me no tip or nothing. Like, that's what it sounded like hearing him talk about it. And the analogy seemed like, oh, TikTok must literally be doing that. But you don't know, right? Because there's been many moments in time when people go viral and then fall off. Yeah. But it was something about the way that people were describing it happening to them that you're like, this sounds like to me, right? We're trying to create stars, yeah. right? And and I think that still has shown through and through. We need to legitimize ourselves and we, to, and we know to do that we have to create stars, mm-hmm. right? Period. Charlie D'Amelio, she's a star. We know that she fits a certain mold as well create this star mm-hmm. 
right? I mean, there's other segments and levels of stars, and this becomes our our brand, right? This is our Disney. I've used that analogy before, right? Disney has its stars. Uh, you know what? I mean, it's been so many throughout the years. I'm trying to name somebody newer, but I don't watch that shit no more. <laughs> so I was just go like Miley, Miley Cyrus, or you know Raven, or like anybody, Zac Efron, right? Yeah. Creating stars, creating stars, creating stars that people can vouch for, and you can say, oh, they came from this, right? That validates your platform. Yeah. Right. So I guess that's part of what they're looking at in music as well. Is like, how can we create these stars? Mm. And once you do that, that builds your brand as a whole. Yeah. All right. Yeah, because that's a good point. Because TikTok following still has, isn't as respected as following on other platforms. Not like, yet. Not even it, like TikTok is still looked at as you build this large audience to funnel it over to something else. So even their biggest yeah. stars are. I mean, they're spinning the narrative to say this is a TikTok star, but they're really just like global platform stars. By yeah. the time that other people start to recognize them, they're TikTok stars within TikTok, but then nobody cares when they're TikTok stars just within TikTok. Yep. Right? And so it, it's weird because like even having a million followers on TikTok feels like having like 10,000 followers on Instagram. You know, 100%. like in terms of like how, even even how much the platform cares about you and, and does things for you. So like, I see that. Like They're like, no, we need some legitimate heavy hitter, recognizable people that people can point back to and say like, hey, that person came from TikTok. Yep. They live, breathe, eat, represent TikTok. We did that. We can do it again. Bring your whole roster <laughs> over here and let us do it. Facts. Yeah. It's facts and yeah, that that we can do it ourselves again is is a huge part. And actually now I'm kind of saying it out loud, it's much easier to do that with a music artist and a general influencer because the music travels so far, right? Like they get mm. that brand and, and people are always going to like, oh, this guy pop off TikTok, right? Versus like influencers. Like I said, man, I've come across influencers with millions of followers on TikTok. Like maybe not tens of millions, but at least like let's say somewhere between like one to one to eight. And you go look at their other socials that are not as well known, yeah. right? You see them at certain things. People don't care as much. <laughs> they still have a lot of people that care, but not yeah. to the degree that you would think. They're like, man, this person got three million TikTok followers, but you would think she would be crazy right now. Yeah, on what they at. So it's, it's it's weird, bro. It's like I, I'm thinking because it comes so fast, and we're so used to seeing so many people with large followings on there. It's not it's not as respected. Like you see a YouTuber with. A million subscribers, like that's the user. You know what they went through to get oh, there. Yeah. You like, oh no, nah, bro, yeah, respect, yeah. bro. Like you, you either really figured it out. You've been doing this shit for a long guy's time. Something. You see a TikToker with a million followers, like that shit literally could just happen yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Old money, new money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that that is really interesting. That that whole respect factor as well. Yeah, I, I actually have a, a homie that works at a tattoo shop mm -hmm. and. She was saying this big TikToker came in, you know, trying to claw his way up into a free tattoo. He's like, I got, I got 400k on TikTok, and he was, they was like, bro, we don't give a fuck. I'm like, yeah, nobody. I said 400k, that's nothing, bro. Like he should, he should you could tell him come out when he got at least five. You know what I'm saying? We got five, <laughs> then people might care. I said 400k, bro, nobody cares. But that's, that, you might as well say I got 3,000 Facebook friends. You know what I'm saying? Especially to that demographic, especially to. Yeah, people yeah. in tattoo shops, nah, bro. Yeah, yeah they don't nah, not at all. <laughs> you the wrong type of people to cloud up on. See. And it's funny you say that because it's really interesting that we are at a new sensitivity culturally mm. in terms of following, right? Mm. A million followers. So many people with a million followers in our mind. Yeah, but, damn, you know, yeah. give it 10 years ago, you're like, dang, a million followers? They must be somebody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But now somebody could have just caught a viral moment. They could have trolled their way into a million, could be fake followers. Like, there's so many other factors to it. A million is met with skepticism, and there's no immediate respect that comes from it. Like you said, in the rare case, YouTube. And maybe Twitter. YouTube and Twitter are the only platforms yeah. I, I res respect the way, because you know how hard it is to grow on those platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I can see that. I don't, yeah, I don't really run into the million Twitter followers. I was about to say, I don't even think I know anybody <laughs> with a million Twitter followers. I can, well, yeah, actually, I don't, I don't think I know anybody with a million Twitter followers. Well, yeah. Come on, I'm trying to think of like a Travis Scott or like a. Drake or somebody maybe has it. Maybe. Oh, let's see. Yeah, right. now, now I need to know. Yeah, we do a quick. There got to be somebody. Right? At this point, it has to be somebody. I mean, we know that there's like people like, uh, you know, Kim Kardashian, Obama, stuff like that. But yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Drake got oh, 39. Yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. Travis Scott got 11 million. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, we know they, but for me, I'm thinking more like. New age. Not even. No, not even that. Just 
like how we know a lot of almost regular influencers that mm-hmm. have a million. Okay, yeah. yeah. Right? It's yeah. so common on these other platforms. Twitter, you just don't. Like you you really are somebody most most of the time yeah, exactly. when you have that million. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you got a million on on Twitter. I'll definitely have to like Google you or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did you get that? But it's, it's like it's so much more respect on those platforms because they make you work for they make you work a lot more for it. The creators see the value in it because they get certain levels of perks and money and things like that. Versus, like I said, with TikTok, bro, you could hit the right button and build a million followers and. A matter of days and weeks, and so yep. I think the audience doesn't value it as much because they see it as, as like not necessarily like a fleeting thing. I think TikTok might be the only platform where everybody on it genuinely feels like they have a chance. Like I don't oh, watch yeah. I don't watch YouTube videos and look at the bigger. Like, I don't watch YouTube and look at Mr. Beast and think like, oh, I could be be, be Mr. Beast. You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> Shit, you know nah. maybe, but I don't think that. I don't. I don't. I don't get on. You know, I almost. Look, I almost look at Mr. Beast and think like, dang, that seemed painful. <laughs> like to get to that number, it's, it's, it's out of reach. You know, yeah, <laughs> and right. I don't really have that many limited beliefs when it comes to what I can do content wise. But that, I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> but do I even want that? Yeah, but it's like on TikTok, literally, your audience is looking yeah. at you like, I could do that. Mm-hmm. I could be there. Yeah, and it's not like it on every other platform. Yep, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Now you already alluded to this stat mm-hmm. that we're going to share, talking about the YouTube and TikTok competition. So we talked about YouTube monetizing shorts coming next year. Mm-hmm. So more information has come out. YouTube is monetizing shorts, and it'll be a forty-five percent revenue split. It means they're taking forty-five percent, right? And I know that seems like a big percentage. TikTok is taking 50% though, mm-hmm. right? So this is their Pulse program. If you don't know, this is different than the Creator Fund. To me, the Creator Fund, I eh, don't really see that, that worth it. Um, I've typically, I've actually advised a few people not to do the Creator Fund based on word from other people I know who, have the, who did their Creator Fund and tried it. But the TikTok Pulse, that itself does um it seems to be better better but then you know there's some caveats as we're about to get into so you got the 45 percent split when it comes to youtube shorts and let's see starting early 2023 ah and here's a note it's almost like spotify and how they're distributing that money though Mm -hmm. right so the 45 percent split of revenue that they're taking is from the overall pool of ad revenue, which also means they're sharing that, well, you're sharing that 55% with the other creators. So what you take in is proportional to the the amount that you are in that pool. So Ja'Cory got 100,000 views. I only got 10 views. We're taking in different money, right? Based on that alone, because the revenue pool is the revenue pool. Now with that in mind, TikTok is different. TikTok posts. You got to have 100K subscribers. Yep. Uh, What's the other one? 100K subscribers. Top 4% of. Ah, that's the actually, no, that's all I was thinking about YouTube shorts. Let me rewind for a second. Not only you have to have a thousand subscribers for YouTube shorts, the regular monetization, and you also have to have 10 million views on shorts Mm -hmm. specifically over the last 90 days, which means you got to stay over that 10 million too when you get in, I think. Um, yeah, I think, I don't think you can, from what I've seen before, actually, no, from what I've seen before, typically once you get in, you get, you're in with YouTube. Yeah, yeah. But we'll have to see if there's an update, if it's rolling, if you have to maintain that 10 million plus once you get in. Now, TikTok, on the other hand, though, yeah, you have to have 100,000. And then like Corey, what you were alluding to, here's the caveat. The top four percent, the top four percent of the creators or videos, right, will get ads on those. Now, what does that mean? Like, yeah, you can be in the program, but that doesn't mean you're going to get paid. <laughs> you have to be in the top four percent. So it's like, oh yeah, I got a hundred thousand um, followers, but what are the chances that I'm going to be in the top four percent if there's other people in here with millions of followers? And some, getting millions of views regularly. Some tens of millions. 
<laughs> it's basically TikTok's way of saying like, hey, we're going to go pay these people, but we do want you to know you have a chance. They selling hope, bro. Yes. They are selling hope. <laughs> I guess it is the one-off chance of like, your video goes viral, right? Like, like 100,000 creator, 100,000 follower creator has a chance of getting a higher view video than like, let's say, Char D'Amelio. It's, it's, it's possible. So, Maybe that's how they're looking at it. Like, yo, you're probably not going to consistently be getting paid out, but you keep doing your thing. You keep working hard. You keep grinding out those trends. And, yeah. you know, you'll get paid sometime. There is that chance. <laughs> and then maybe some of those folks are just so big they won't do get in at all. No, they're taking that back. Yeah. They got to. They be stupid not to. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, look, <laughs> they be like, right? let's turn off our ad revenue. They be like, right. wow, you're doing For it what? anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're here anyway. You're already doing it, yeah. <laughs> ah. Yeah, I, that that caveat's weird, man. Only the top four percent versus doing the pool system, but TikTok does a lot of right moves wrong sometimes for me. Anyway, yeah, I think like you said, it, it, they're more focused on I think brand because let's go back to what you had said, right? Like they need to prove that they're legitimate stars coming out of this platform. How do you do that? Get these motherfuckers paid, yeah. right? So we're gonna take the top four percent. So these people are the people who are the most likely to become that person out of here based on our data, right? There's always somebody that could come along and sweep it, but based on what we can see, these, I don't know how many accounts that would be. I'm, I'm assuming 4% out of tickets, probably maybe be somewhere around like a couple thousand creators or something, right? So here are the, let's say 5,000 people that we think have the best chance of being our Molly Cyrus or our Raven Simone or whatever, right? Now, we can't have them out in the world being laughed at for being broke and not being <laughs> as paid as a YouTuber <laughs> Or or a Twitch streamer, right? Or that's or, true. Hey, or, that's a really good point, man. <laughs> like we can't have them broke because then that invalidates our platform. It's like, hey, y'all got views, but we got money. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, no, you, like, you got to now get these people paid. It's like, why you have fifty million followers and you, you telling me you at your mom's house broke? Like, I'm back to YouTube, right? Back to Instagram, right? So now it's like, yeah. okay, well, let's maybe take. I'm looking at. They're thinking maybe let's take care of the top percent first, get them right, and then I'm sure over time they'll probably try to figure out how to disperse it to everybody because, you know, going back to the competing with YouTube thing, that's what they're going to have to figure out to seriously compete with YouTube. Yeah, they don't have to. Yeah. yeah, it's like, if you can't figure out how to pay everybody, YouTube still got you beat because YouTube knows how to pay everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're damn good at that right there. <laughs> Checks their own time it. every month. <laughs> <laughs> Never once worried where the money was at. Hey, facts, <laughs> facts. And that brings me to where they're showing the ads, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, thought it was interesting they were saying that YouTube Shorts, it's going to appear, well, no. YouTube Shorts, you're going to get a, a, a pay from the full revenue stream anyway, mm -hmm. right? So you're running Shorts, you're in that program, and it's the pool. So more specific to uh, TikTok, you'll get paid for ads that show before your video, but not after your video. Yeah. All right? It's interesting, right? I don't have a complete way to judge. I saw some people being more ju judgmental on that. Do you have any... Any commentary on that specifically? No, like like you said, I think it's one of those things I'll have to like see in action first before mm -hmm. having a hard opinion on it. Because at first, I was confused on is it every ad that shows up before my video I get paid for? Is it just like the first ad or that mm -hmm. comes up before that I get paid for? And then I was like, man, why wouldn't you get paid for the videos after? My video was the video that held their attention long enough for them right. to even swipe into they, the next video. They could have hopped off that. Exactly. Right at you. You could have sucked. And they was like, boom, we out. So that's where I'm kind of at with it. It's like, I, there needs to be more clarification on it. I know it's new. It's probably not coming for a minute. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I am I'm, just think it's weird. Like, Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's almost stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know enough. Right? They got more information than me. But from my <laughs> bird's eye view, right? Because I'm thinking I could see that making sense on YouTube mm -hmm. because I clicked this video and now you're showing me the ad. Mm -hmm. But YouTube on TikTok, I didn't even know what I was about to see anyway. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like you said, at least, hey, you watched my video and they didn't get off the app off of my video. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just appeared on the video. That doesn't make, that doesn't quite add up. I don't understand that, uh, that philosophy. But I do remember hearing that whenever you do a swipe, and they pass your video, you still get paid. They don't even yeah. have to watch your video yeah. when you are in that program, yeah. which is also kind of weird. But you know, I guess appreciate it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. But Not either way, then we got to go back to only the top four percent of people being paid. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, we talk about 
the users, all right, you got some money because you're popping on the platform. We want to get y'all paid. One aspect of it also might be in some way protecting the brands, all right? Because whoever these top users, whoever they tend to be, hey, the brands probably want to be on those pages and they probably don't want to have campaigns that are popping up on pages that are so small for whatever reason, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what the the um, caveat is, but then you add, I forgot about this. I'm glad I just remembered it. You have the other um, specification. Wait, is this YouTube or TikTok? I believe it's TikTok. They're going to be basing it on your genre. Yeah, it's TikTok. That's TikTok. Yeah. So if you are food and I'm Little Debbie running an ad or Pringles or Lay's chips, right? It's going to probably pop up on a food influencer's video, most likely. Yeah. Right? Or a at least a video of a regular influencer talking about food or eating some food in it. So it doesn't even make sense for everybody anyway. So I can't just be an artist. And then I got some, some alcohol. No, they don't even like having alcohol on TikTok. And just having some some little Debbie cake ads popping up before my video, that's probably not going to happen. Where on YouTube, that kind of could, no, that does happen. Yeah, so yeah, because yeah. it's based <laughs> off of your behavior. So I can go watch some real estate videos. And then I'm like, let me go watch this video of Ja'Cory dropping some music gems. And because I watched that real estate video, I will still see some, mm -hmm. like some real estate ads. Right? So the money comes regardless. But it sounds like... I mean, Jacory, if ain't no music people paying any <laughs> any money to nothing. run no ads, it doesn't matter. Yeah, they got nothing. Doesn't matter. Nothing. So, oh, there's a lot of questions for the TikTok uh, creator payout, but I feel like I predict changes in the future. That's yeah, all I'm saying. 100. <laughs> I was gonna ask, like, do we give them the benefit of the doubt for at least trying to step in the right direction? I feel like most people are gonna say no. You know, yeah, because yeah, of YouTube, and they know that. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I said, brother, like they they see the mountain they have to climb to yeah. be a serious competitor with YouTube, and the biggest hurdle is money, because that's the one the thing that's always gonna keep YouTube in the top, bro. Hey, you can go to all them other platforms you want, build all the audience you want, but who paying you the most? Who's paying you the most? <laughs> who you gonna come back to? Period. Period. Exactly. <laughs> now, with that being said, we got to do a hard right and make a switch. Because it's that time of year. Oh, okay. The end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait. You know where I was going. <laughs> it's the end of the year, and the industry is shutting down. The music industry in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, some industries turn up at this time. Music industry, hey, people vacate for real. Like, they, until I really start taking myself more seriously in the music industry, I'm like, dang, these people really do like shut down. They be gone. I'm like, bro, what you doing? Because I came from jobs where you like New Year's Eve, get five more calls in, bro. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to make a sale and set yourself up or whatever. So like, no, nah, these people really that they be M MIA. So the music industry is, industry is shutting down and that has implications for what you might be doing for your rollouts. Mm -hmm. Um the people you might be trying to connect with mm -hmm. and even the way you're able to market your music. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Ja'Cory, I'll let you lead the way when it comes to, let's start with Spotify and how things change around Spotify this time of year. Yeah. So this is the time of the year where you are reminded that these are just people with a job um, <laughs> and they all, as, ma as amazing as a lot of them might be at their jobs, it's still just a job to them and they want to go home and do nothing and be with their family. So uh, I actually think Spotify might already be on vacation. If not, it'll probably be maybe within a week or so after this this podcast episode coming out. And that's the biggest thing with, with them. Spotify, Apple, pretty much all of the major DSPs, when they go on their breaks, editorial playlists are a lot harder to get. Uh, you might have that one person in the building or your rep that likes you enough to continue pushing you. You could be a big enough artist where you know, they wake you up like, hey, bro, now you're on vacation, but Drake just dropped, put that, put that man in the playlist, right? So there are some some caveats to people that can kind of get around it, but for majority of artists, like, you are probably not getting editorial placements right now. Yeah. Um, or it's going to be very, very hard for you to even pitch yourself an editorial placement because they're not checking their email, bro. They don't break, you know, they, they, they're they out doing things. Um, so if your marketing strategy is very editorial reliant and you are not a big enough artist 
to kind of circumvent that, or you don't have a strong enough relationship with your rep. So were they willing to, you know, leave their family for a little bit to help you out, <laughs> then it's it's probably not worth it to be dropping music, you know, or or dropping songs that you want to have that type of a push. If you're just dropping such as to give your fans something and to hold them over, then yeah, of course you can still do it right. But if you're like, no, I need this shit to go, this shit really need to go, then they'll probably ain't time for that, you know? Yeah, it's not a chance. It's not, like really, you know, it's almost too, no, it's too late already, mm-hmm. right? You really should look at October as your last month mm-hmm. to plan ahead. Cause hey, if I can't schedule this thing before I leave the office, <laughs> <laughs> then it's not gonna happen. I'm not about to come out, like you said, unless it's one of the big ones that, you know, things move. Well, I really like it. Right? Like Sam, Sam got his artists in some playlists, but he was telling me like the relationship they have with their, their editorial person, like she really likes him. So she was willing to be like, all right, I'll I, I help you out. And she didn't get him nothing yeah. massive. But she got him a couple of things to show, like, hey, I fuck with you. I'm still on break. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's important. That's when we always go back to the importance of relationships. Yeah. Relationships. And that's established over time. Mm-hmm. It's not like he came in, some had some major label, give him these or anything. That's a direct relationship contact built over time. Yeah. All right. So relationships are, are, are definitely going to give you a little bit of extra leeway in this time of year. But for the most part, USOL and just Mm -hmm. leave it at that. Right. Right. So that's Spotify. Now, another thing is advertising. I was just talking to somebody the other day um, and my brother too, ironically. Two people, not even in music, but they're like trying to run ads for something, right? Different things. And I was like, hey, y'all haven't done any type of, well, one person was doing a course, right? You haven't really sold anything online before. December ain't the time to start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially if it's not even like, oh, it's a Christmas specific winter. I don't know a specific thing. Like, no, it's not a time to just, oh, oh let me try to use my extra time to run some ads and yeah. hope to make some money. This ain't that time. <laughs> like the the numbers get heavy because you got to think it's more competitive in that time, which means it's more expensive in that time. Yep. And that's never going to change. So you think like, oh, well, I might catch people slipping because no one's going to be running ads because they know it's competitive. So maybe I actually hit them on a less competitive. Nah, that's not going to happen. Because these companies, these big companies, they work that into their numbers. Yeah, they don't care. They don't care. (laughs) Hey, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars. This is just what we do. Yeah. Period is not gonna change, and we got to make shit happen for Christmas. Period. It's like you a little whoever with your fifty cent bid. You know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> you know, you're not about to get this. We're prepared to lose lots of money to to win over these customers. Hey, but you're not. Facts. And so it, it that it's also important to mention too. Like that's that's usually the most uh the case in most of the 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 bigger countries. I, I don't know where I'm looking for. I don't want to say like first world country, but the more why don't you want to say it, Jaquil? I don't know, man. I feel like I feel, feel like, dirty. Yeah, feel, feel, feels <laughs> fucked up, you know. Let's say it's more of the consumer centric countries, right? Okay. Let's, let's say that. So like your U.S., your Canada, your United Kingdoms, right? Like those countries is a mm-hmm. lot more. You can probably still rent ads in places that don't care as much about the holiday seasons or their holiday season is different. Mm. Um, you know, maybe your Brazil's, your India's, things like that. But most of you probably ain't trying to do that all the time. So I know what we tell clients is. Hey, it's not saying it's a, it, it's a, it's bad to run ads during this time. You can still get good conversions. There are still going to be people. I would argue more people paying attention to social media, which is was so ironic about it, right? Right. Yeah, there's right. way more people looking, but it's more expensive at this time. But so it's like you can still pull an audience out. It just might be, you know, in August your ad might have been getting you a fifty cent cost per click, and then December rolled around, that's just a dollar seventeen. You still maybe getting high conversions. Maybe your music is still growing. I'd be at a slower rate. But you're still pulling quality people out. So I know we're telling clients, hey, there are going to be some platforms where we might advise you to just shut it down. Because I know for us, YouTube is typically one of the the one we have the most issues with around holiday time. YouTube around this time, crazy. Oh, yeah. The, the damn near damn near such a hassle to work with. <laughs> Other ones, Facebook, yeah. TikTok, whatever, they get expensive. They're not, they're not like hard to work. We're not having like issues with them getting pushed through. Yeah. Um, so it's like, yo, there might be some where we completely advise you to shut it down altogether. 
And then there may be others where we say like, hey, this might be worth you just kind of biting the bullet and dealing with the higher cost per conversions or cost per clicks or whatever, because when, you know, January, February rolls around and this shit stops, usually it's around February, like what, right when February rolls around and this shit stops and things are out of normal, all this data we built up, right? Like all the, the, the brand value you've been building in the marketplace, like that shit's going to damn near double, triple then because you, you, you're not going to be starting over like all the artists who took December through or November through right, January. Right, right. So, but that, and that depends on what your plan is, right? Yeah, exactly. If the beginning of the year for whatever your rollout or your yearly plan is, like at the beginning of the year is really important. You got to get popping for whatever that um, reason that is. Like I know there's some people who are, like last year, we had some people that really stressed wanting to be able to start doing some tours mm -hmm. or do some shows like by March mm -hmm. or whatever, which means we have to set up and create the fan base or the level, certain level of awareness that you'll be touring with, right? Yeah. So things like that, then you probably want to start early, which means you could justify marketing at the end of the, the, uh, December and really you know, running through December, I would still probably advise not. Mm. But right after Christmas, like that was where we saw some success, like in between that. So what the six days in between Christmas and, and New Year's, like yeah. let it start. Then you go ahead and get that warmed up. That's enough. As long as you're spending enough money, you know. What, 20 to 50 dollars a day in that period of time, like five dollars a day isn't really going to warm you up. Like we're, we're, cool, we're cool with five dollars a day ads for people who want to do that. But you're not gonna get warmed up fast enough to see the results like what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, five dollars is like twenty cents during this time. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So keep that in mind. But you know, even like you said, the attention is really there, which means content. Yes. This is the time for content to go hard on content, and really, you want to have momentum with content too. Like it's nice to already have an audience if you have been doing content all year to then just be able to use that extra time to go harder and take mm -hmm. advantage of attention, yeah. right? That's really going to be meaningful as the recession comes as well, but we'll get into that and like do a whole episode or video, like just breaking down some things artists can do or keep in mind for the recession times. But content is, it's something that, look, you want to use this time to, to make happen. Yeah, bro. It's like, so if you don't want to spend any money anyway, might as well start figuring out the free, the free ways to do it. Figure out the free. <laughs> Figure out the free. Now, with that being said, I want to, before we leave this, get into just a few promo ideas. Because some people, they don't like, they say, should I do a promotional idea? Like, I'm an indie artist. We're big in saying indie artists don't have to follow label moves, right? Mm -hmm. Just because of the industry shoots, uh, shuts down from a label standpoint, a corporate standpoint, it doesn't mean that an indie artist can't drop anything during yeah. December. Attention is attention. We just talked about, hey, people are at home. People are paying more attention online. So that could be a great time for you. You got less competition from a music standpoint, mm -hmm. right? But there's some caveats. Like we know, generally speaking, a lot of people revert back to more like Christmas type traditional um, traditional type of music. So now you compete with those. But at the same time, there's some things that you can pay attention to with the campaigns, which we'll get into those specifics. I want to start, though, with if you have a fan base already. All right. Because yeah. if you have a fan base already. This is a great time to reengage and create a reason to talk to your fans. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Let me see. Yes, we can offer a holiday merch deal. Like there's. I got a friend who every single year, the numbers he runs up on merch every December is ridiculous, mm. right? For multiple artists, because he works with multiple artists on it. And these are major artists. And I didn't realize, I didn't realize they took it so seriously, to be honest. Mm. Like, it's almost like how toys are like, these are going to be Christmas gifts in that time of year thing. They treat it like that. And I'm like, are people really looking at I don't know, Drake merch? Like, hey, let me get that merch for Christmas. Mm. Or do they care? The numbers say they care. Hey, that shit works. <laughs> <laughs> like the numbers that buddy be team like, oh man, we did three million last year, man. And and one year, um, like he was talking about how when COVID happened, that 
they did their normal thing, but the supply shortage was crazy. And all and since the shortage was what it was, all of a sudden the people who got uh you know bigger bigger budgets, right? Those bigger companies, those suppliers and vendors, they start moving towards those people. It's like, well, if somebody's gonna suffer, it's gonna be my small vendors. Yeah. Right. And yeah. these people are making a few million, but you know, these other people <laughs> that they're competing with are worth tens of millions and hundreds of millions worth of business, yeah. right? So that's something to consider. That might be, I don't know what it's like now. We do know the supply shortage still applies when it comes to merch, but I don't think it's anywhere near as crazy, obviously, as 2020 when it was a surprise. But he was like, yeah, man, I had to call all these backup suppliers, put in some threats, and, you know, I've been consistent <laughs> uh, with business, da 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 finally for them to go find <laughs> This one color, because we had already sold, I don't know how much money in this color. These are like the real logistical things yeah. <laughs> that actually are like become really more important. Like I know a lot of times we talk, we focus on getting views, getting growth, and making sales, but the actual running of the business <laughs> and dealing with that stuff is that really is the game. So yeah. <laughs> once y'all get to that point, y'all y'all start to encounter those things. But but um. Like doing something like that, right? Re-engaging for merch. We know that that's important. Um, and merch can look like anything, not just clothes, obviously. Or giving a single. like, But not like, hey, I'm trying to grow and, and blow it up. Like maybe you just want to say, hey, here's a special single for y'all, a song I recorded because you mm -hmm. already have a fan base. Or maybe just doing a special message. And it's like some video that's memorable mm -hmm. and you send it out to your fan base. Just you have to use, if you already have fans, I don't care if it's just 100 on your email list you got to take advantage of that moment to do something that like brands you in their memory yo such and such hopped into a sleigh in the middle of the street and started rapping out of it you know oh, what wow. i mean or <laughs> or he was sitting in the middle of the, of the intersection and you know people honking a horn at him he got a sleigh creating something you know just something that they're going to remember yeah and then you know if you got a certain type of audience maybe that's just showing love and healing whatever that looks like but you got to use it to at least as an excuse to stamp you in their memory an extra time and then you know make money if you down for that side of things too yeah i agree with that holiday time is definitely the best time for for community engagement because you can do so many th things under the guise of like holiday spirit right like you say even That's like it's your chance to be more emotional be more vulnerable if you feel like you need to your chance to give away things that maybe you weren't gonna do something with anyway i got these songs that i hate i don't think that well maybe i hate but i got this song that i don't know if i'm ever gonna put out let me just give it to them as a gift. Right? I wasn't going to do nothing with it anyway. Let mm -hmm. me just make them feel like I'm doing something about them. So I agree. I think like now is the time to go back and figure out a way to rework your email list and work your SMS list. You know what I'm saying? Dust off that Discord group and get back in there and get active. You know, yeah. have some town hall meetings. Give it, like, you, you probably have more free time as an artist as well. Most of you, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. depending on age and things like that. So. Like take the time out to like talk to your audience a lot more. Do more live streams. Do more like I said, town halls and your different socials. Do and respond to more DMs and, and be more personable. You know, don't just write a three word message back. Send them a voice message, right? Send them a video. Exactly. Or something. Like, you got don't, more time to do don't it. Don't just do that general. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Y'all are so supportive. And then leave because there's so many people doing that. You're mm -hmm. not gonna be remembered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bro. Hit them with the video message, man, or the yeah, voice hey. message. They gonna they gonna download that shit, make it their home screen. You in there, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things roll back around you, great. So I, I do think, I do like, I do think that that that's what this time is for: community engagement, figuring out how to monetize. Because this is a low barrier way for you to figure out how to monetize. Because you can try a lot of things that you may not have normally gotten away with uh, the rest of the year under the guise of holiday season, yep. Black Friday deal, Christmas deal, Thanksgiving deal. Yo, yo, I want to sell these t-shirts that i couldn't sell the rest of the year i was selling them for 20 i want to get them off of, for 10 if i sell them at 10 any other time of the year people are gonna think oh it's because he can't get these t-shirts off if i sell them for ten dollars now that's like oh it's a christmas deal you know what i'm saying like he, yep. just, he just fuck with us and thought, that's a christmas <laughs> deal for it. so exactly this is the it. time for you to get off a lot of those you know pricing bundling 
you know what I'm saying, different merchandising options that might look a certain way the other, you know, nine, ten months out of the year. But now it's just like, okay, he's he's making something work for the holidays. Holiday spirit, man. <laughs> yeah, holiday just, just spirit. Just another one of these mini deals I'm seeing at the time. And it works. <laughs> it really does work. Like, that's that's the part, the stress. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's like, you think, oh, I'm just, am I just writing stuff or everybody's doing it? Does it work? Even though everybody's doing it, it still, it still hits. All right, so now with that being mine, um, another thing for the campaigns is the influencers, right? Yeah. We, we talk about that. So the ads, Spotify, editorial playlists, and influencers. And in your words, they go back to being regular people go too. Go back to being regular people. Right? Bro. Um, to be- so <laughs> <laughs> these superheroes, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, they, oh, I'm on vacation. Yep. And I can't tell you. You know, I felt bad sometimes. Like, cause I'll be like, like, no, go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you mean? I just need you to post for this campaign. I remember one, we had a campaign that we were supposed to run and it, we had like 15 grand for that campaign. I fucking know exactly what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, and it was December. They came to us December, you know, and like we couldn't really get off the money. Yeah. Because everybody was on vacation. It's like, bro, this is such a great opportunity. Such a big artist and all that. And everything that they're doing. There's so much money over here for us. We just need to make this thing work. And all these influencers, you know, want to take care of their mental health and shit. You know? Yeah, man. <laughs> it's like, ah, I don't want to be like, go back to work. But, but do this one post. Yeah. F everybody else. But do this one post. So it's, it really is difficult and can be especially when you deal with influencers who can afford to yeah. not That's take no extra one. money yeah <laughs> all the ones who already aren't making a lot anyway so they really don't care you know yeah. like i only get like one of these a month so mm-hmm. i can pass off on this one this month yep and the young ones the young ones oh, the young ones. ones any influencer really under like 26 you probably gonna deal with it they on christmas break <sighs> you know what i'm saying they going on vacation with their parents Shit like that. That'd be the funny stuff, man. Yeah. Like, I'm with my parents. I'm like, oh man, I forgot that I'm dealing with a kid. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, we had one tell us, like, oh, you know, I'm on Christmas break and I just really wanted to enjoy my Christmas break, but I'll be back making things in January. I'm like, when you go back to school, this is the time for you to run your bag up, bro. You ain't got nothing but time. Bro, that's the confusing part <laughs> for me, bro. Because I'm like, when I was in school, that was opposite logic. Yeah. Like, how do you have more time during school and you just want to, like, you have a busy break like that? Yeah. My breaks weren't popping like that when yeah, I was young, man. Saying. I'm like, I'm sitting in the house just more time watching TV and shit. Like, <laughs> right. until mom get back until those couple of days come that are popping like Christmas or whatever, yeah. you know, it'll be concentrated. But most of the break, I'm not doing a thing. Well, really, and I don't know if a lot of influencers listen to us, but if y'all do, if I was you guys, this would be the time where I would reach out to every marketing partner I've ever worked with, anyone that's ever paid me for a campaign, a post, anything like that. And I would reach out to them and let them know I'm available right now to do work if you need it. Because trust and believe we are not the only ones that struggle with this around oh, <laughs> around yeah. this time. That is a great idea. And it makes you look great. Like you like you can literally just be like, hey, hey, you know, hey Sean, bro, really enjoyed working that 24K Golden campaign with you guys back in March. Just wanna let you know that even though the holiday times are up, I got a little free time this month. Let me know if you need anything from me again. Here's my last couple of posts. They've been doing great. Hope to hear from you soon. I'd be like, you know what? We do need somebody right now. Hey, I forgot sure about you. It. Like, I have this one TikTok influencer who DMs me every week asking me if we have campaigns. And he's massive. Like He has maybe like 15 million followers on TikTok. Maybe close to a million on Instagram and probably like 400 on YouTube. Man. Every week he DMs me and asks me if we have campaigns. He got that money making machine do, optimized, <laughs> man. Optimized. <laughs> Like, hey, bro, just checking in. Got anything coming down the pipeline? Like, nah, not this week, man. All right, holler at you next week, then. Next week, come around. <laughs> hey, bro, just checking in. Got anything coming on the pipeline? Nah, bro, we ain't really been doing a TikTok. And I was like, okay, right, check on you again. Like, every week, bro. I'm like, man, why can't all of them be like you? Bruh. <laughs> Closed mouths don't get fed. Unsent emails don't get open, man. Yeah. And those sent emails, they really do come in handy because we work with so many people, all right, mm-hmm. on the influencer end specifically. And you really do forget about some of them yeah. at times. Yeah. Right. And some fall off because of unreliability or something happens with the profile for a period of time. It's so much. 
it's always nice sometimes just to get that message like exactly what you said you're like oh man i appreciate this and since they hit me up i'm probably not gonna have to worry about a long lag Mm -hmm. and responsiveness and try to chase them down just so they can post like that goes a really really long way for a marketer and it's also a nice time like especially if i'm like a solo artist Mm -hmm. or um like a just a manager and an artist right not a big agency or team this is when again you go back to relationships and having those few people that you do a lot of business with time over time over time because then they'll be more likely to open your message or at least give you a a clear like hey i can't do it because the i can't do it because i'm going to be on vacation x y and z is a lot better than just being unread and yeah. you're like yeah man i hope they reply i hope they reply if i, I could deal with not with knowing that they didn't ghost me out of nowhere yeah. you know what i mean so yeah y'all let people know because people are look, as jacory said we appreciate it yeah exactly That's much, it. much appreciate it so <laughs> and i know around this time what we tend to try to well not we don't stray away from it but we use a lot less of them are face for influencers Right, so your actual people, your TikTokers, mm-hmm. even to some degrees like YouTubers, streamers, things like that. Um, we found some success with just using like meme accounts, and I don't know what to call it. What we call them like music blog pages, right? Like your our generation music, your raps, your talk the pops pages like that, because meme accounts and music blog accounts are basically just media outlets, and media outlets never plan to cut off. You know? Oh yeah. Like, you never see a meme page go on Christmas break. You never Not see. At all. Our generation of music be posting on Christmas Day. They be posting on Thanksgiving. Somebody, mm-hmm. somebody got to post that. They know they got to post it. They right. So hey. like those type of influencers, and you know, for some of you guys that's listening, thing like that's not an influencer. Like for for us, we look at anybody with an audience as an influencer, right? Give you a meme page, a person, yep. a viral cat. You got an audience. You are an influencer in my eyes, right? So yeah. we're looking outside of okay, we can't use the dancers, we can't use the reactioners, and certain people. Or they're a lot harder to work with because they want to go spend time with family. But yo, these meme accounts, these music blog pages, these um, viral content curation pages, these people run their operation like a media outlet. Media outlets never plan to cut off. Never. So they tend to work out a lot better, be more responsive and get things up faster than this time, which is great because we're looking for ways to compensate for all these other sides of the influencers that we can't, that we can't really use that much during this time. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, that's that. I really don't think there's anything to add to that. Now, just decide whether you're going to run a campaign or not during mm-hmm. Christmas, if you're going to release or not during Christmas. And we get that question all the time. Yes, you can do it, but you got to consider everything else that we just said. So we'll leave it at that. And I want to have some fun with something that you sent over. Oh, yeah, we good. <laughs> <laughs> Social media users are disappointed that Mary J. Blige hasn't started a boot line yet. Very, very, very good observation and that should happen mm-hmm. it really should oh, let's read a couple of these messages another <laughs> winner where mary j blige has not released a boot line let me see now that you mention it if she got with the design team now could be ready for purchase by next september <laughs> 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 what we need a boot line from you okay love you bye it's beautiful when your fans are giving you this type of feedback, right? Yes, bro. They're basically saying, like, hey, I got some money I want to give you. I got some money I want to <laughs> give you. Listen, I really don't know why she hasn't. She's the die high boots queen. Like, literally, it's so funny. It's one of those things that's so strong. The moment they said it, I know exactly what she was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like I'm following Mary J. Blige. It's just like ever since I've known her, Auntie done had them boots, <laughs> right? <laughs> If she has an affordable line, she single-handedly forced Steve Madden into bankruptcy. It's so funny. I thought I was going to say Steve Harvey for a second. <laughs> well, that line is the one that got me because them assuming it would be affordable, I think, is is the funny part. Because if I saw this type of attention around it, there's no way. I'm not making an affordable boot. <laughs> <laughs> so, the brand. I, I, I don't know. What would Mary J. Blige with her brand be something that she could drop? I don't know. What's, what's cheap in boot world? Like, like $150? I think that's affordable in boot, boot world. Yeah, so she yeah. they'll probably at least be three fifty, yeah. four hundred for her. That's what yeah. I think. Yeah, which might still be affordable still in girl boot world. I think that's know? still respectable. Yeah, I think yeah, ladies, y'all out there, let us know what's respectable in boot world. <laughs> um, let me let, let me just see Google thigh high boots. <laughs> well, she will say Steve Madden since they called out Steve Madden. What's Steve Madden? 
out here with 129, 159, 109. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So she, she, oh, yeah. Nah, she, she coming at Steve Madden price. You can't go no less than that. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Yeah. No way. So, one, right? What's the lesson? Use this fan feedback. Bam. Look at it. She killing the whole outfit. All right. Go on, Mary J. Bam. 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 Yeah, she got every color, every kind throughout her whole career. So, this is the beautiful thing. Like, now that we see this, let's think about how you can be intentional about this, all right? A lot of times people think, oh, I have my own clothing brand or I have something I'm trying to market, so let me wear it all the time. Let me put it in front of people all the time. But you also could do the reverse and not have it and market, even though even though it's not her brand, right? Just market that this is an item that I wear mm-hmm. that's significant for my brand. Which is dope. It's like, I'm always wearing the high boots. Eventually, I could drop a brand or it could make sense for me to do a collaboration with somebody, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But like, again, it made so much sense. The moment someone said it, I'm like, Mary J. Blige is always wearing those kind of boots. It really does make you wonder, like, why doesn't she have the boot, right? Maybe maybe going back to the logistics stuff, she might have seen something on the back end that makes her feel like it's not worth it. Yeah. I don't know how easy it is to put a boot together. I would assume scale of one to ten, probably somewhere between a six and an eight, you know? Yeah. Um, In terms of the work that needs to be done. But I feel like she could at least do, like, a special capsule drop, right? At least. 50 50 boots. uh, $500 Five hundred dollars a piece, maybe not fifty then. Five hundred boots, five hundred. That'd be especially. Yeah, that. I mean, cause she has so much legacy too. There's a lot of special shit that she could do. Or, or she take the Taylor Swift route, and instead of pushing vin- well, yeah, instead of pushing vinyls <laughs> to drive her album sales, <laughs> she pushed boot sales to drive her album sales. Every 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 boot hey. comes with a digital download of whatever <laughs> new album is coming out. You know, we got to play by the rules, so the boots are available on the website for, I don't know, 450 The yeah. bundle, 500 Yeah. You no. Know? And then they shipping out that first week. Shipping out that first week, bro. Boots going to be ready. It's probably not a high demand, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's competitive over as it is like vinyl, <laughs> you know? I wonder if that would really work, bro. It feels like, I feel like I just came up with a finesse. I don't know, man. I feel I, like I just came up with a finesse. I, I like that. I really do like that. <laughs> hey, I mean, the tone has been set. It's, it's such an obvious thing. People are demanding it. Yeah. Oh man, hey yeah, I don't know, bro. And yeah, <laughs> shout out to Mary J, please, yeah, please, please do this. that, bro. So I, I really want to know. We could change the music industry together if we do this by selling boots. Yeah, bro. What? Hey, you know, rewrite the rules. <laughs> it, it follows it, you know. Products sold separately, you know. Yeah. They be shipped out on time. Get the digital download with it. True. I guess it wouldn't count as a music sale though, because not vinyl. Or maybe, maybe she puts vinyls together in the shape of a boot. How can a vinyl play like the in the shape of a boot? It's not for me to figure out. I just it's not for you to figure yeah, out. It's for the, the product person. I to mean, out. actually, <laughs> I, I feel like you could have a vinyl. You know how they have mini vinyls, yeah, and then the rest of it not actually be the vinyl, right? So it's no grooves in it necessarily, or, or it's more decorative grooves, but you really is just that small one in the middle yeah. and then somehow the rest of it is a boot. So I, I, I could see that happening. Yeah, man. Yeah. You'll make that work structurally. Yeah, yeah. Get creative. Okay. <laughs> hey, look. Look, Mary J, not only are you missing out on boot money, you missing out on record sales. I know you done made some sales already. I get it. You know, you're you not set? struggling. You set. Exactly. You set. <laughs> but you could be more set. You know what I mean? <laughs> set up the great grandkids. You know what I mean? So, no, nah, that 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 is, is really dope, though. Because, like just to see, again, like you, all you have to do is advertise an item, and you don't even have to own the item. You can now set up future sales and make that transition easier. Like Earl Sweatshirt got Sweatshirt on the name. His fans, bam, drop sweatshirts. Obviously, it's there, right? I'm trying to think of somebody else who like always wears something in particular. Um, there's somebody who wears hats that I can't think of right now. Chance? No. Pharrell? Maybe? Yes, Pharrell. The, the those ex- yeah, hats. Yeah, those extra hats. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, a lot of people might not you know, be able to pull that off. But just imagine if he was wearing a specific type of hat pretty often that's not for, not as far out. He could probably sell that. But, he, he, I mean, he could probably sell those, though. Like you said, special capsule mm-hmm. collection probably wouldn't be a mass sale thing. But make it something, something special, and I'm already doing this, easy. Yeah, to me, the, the biggest backdrop in this is, you know, back to our, our king, 
uh, Savory Lil Yachty when he never he never dropped hair dye at the time he had red hair. And then he comes out years later and I think he dropped a nail polish line. And it was interesting because I don't think of Lil Yachty and nail polish. That to me feels like a yeah. Kid Cudi move or like a, yeah. I don't know, maybe a Uzi move or a Trippy Red move. Like one of them, I'd have been like, okay. Yeah, yeah, like, but I was like, Yachty and nail polish. No, bro, three years ago, you should have dropped hair dye. <laughs> yeah. I That's what you should have did. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I mean, it's bad, man. Yeah. Should have did like Jay Z. He did Jay Z Blue. He should have did Yachty Red. Yeah. Bro, he could have really kept. Yeah. I would have, I would have, no, dyed my hair with some Yachty dye. <laughs> you would have went all red or you would have? No. No, nah. nah, all red. But I would have, you know, maybe the tips or something. You know okay. Something? That's okay. a show support. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <yeah. laughs> all right, man. But then we got, I think it's time, man, um, that we give some thoughts to this Kanye stuff. I had a, pe- a lot of people ask me about it and I was wondering my thoughts. And there's been a lot that's happened, right? Mm-hmm. So now I feel like we can give a, a better perspective, not just like be of the moment. That type of stuff, I don't know about chasing the moment. You can, you can get caught in some wild stuff yeah. <laughs> and look back and be like, oh, oh, you know, um, but like just the observation, some of the main questions, just generally looking looking at it, right? So we're talking about Kanye and the Adidas moment, the the, the Kanye and the um, the remarks and the accusations of what the remarks represent. I'm not saying it because I don't know what YouTube, you know, YouTube is weird about some words oh, and yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but like, look, I mean, shoot, just for the sake of a clarity, look. Races against Jewish people, right? Mm. So he had that, lost a lot of business, got a lot of pushback from the black community and the Jewish community. Mm. Do you think he's going to, what, what do you think he had any of it planned? Because a lot of, so, you know, there's comments like, oh, this is planned. Oh, he's he's stupid and completely unplanned. He doesn't know what's coming. Or, oh, he planned this, but he didn't expect that. Like, what what was your speculation of that whole thing? I do think some of it was planned. I've seen the conspiracy that he was trying to create the uproar to get out of certain contracts um, because he couldn't legally break, break the contracts, which I, I do believe. I don't think he expected the black community to not side with him. That mm-hmm. I don't think he saw coming. So I think he went into it <laughs> probably thinking like, oh, I will get this backlash from the Jewish community and, and people that support the Jewish community, but my people are going to come take up for me. They're going to be there for me. And I, I'm pretty sure for him it was a shocking and humbling thing to see, like, no, everybody's against me now, right? Like, there aren't mm. that many people in, in, in total that are standing behind me or supporting me. And I I think he saw that because he, he eventually came out and apologized, you know, retracted certain statements, apologized for it. He went on a little bit of an apology rant. He hasn't really ranted about it in a couple of weeks, you know what I'm saying? Like, he kind of quieted down about it. And so that part of it, I feel like, was more massive than he – plan for it to be. I do think he thought, yo, this side is going to backlash, but then this side is going to rise up with me and we're going to defend against it together. You know, my, all my celebrity friends, all my influencer friends, all the powerful people behind the scenes that <laughs> like me and my people, you know, yeah. hopefully they forgiving me about the Trump thing and they come they come side with me and then that shit hit and it was like, nah, you on your own, bro. Like, mm. everybody was like, that's you, bro. You, you deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's a, a lesson in PR, man. Because, you know, a lot of times people think about PR in the moment, mm. right? I said this or I did this and what controversy has been created from this moment. But you don't really think about the long tail, right? The the credit that you've received, but then how much you deposited, or, I mean, how much you withdrew from those deposits, right? Like, kind got a lot of credit from just music in the first place when he created then he started doing some things but he had hella money in the bank you know yeah. what i'm saying yeah so it lasted but he kept withdrawing he kept withdrawing and then he started withdrawing from specific communities mm-hmm. he started withdrawing from the black community specifically in certain ways so then like you said you get to this moment where you think you'll have that community without a doubt mm-hmm. and you didn't realize how much money you took when you that that credit card swiped <laughs> that shit didn't approve. You're yeah. like, oh, no. Nah. 
mama. Like, had a call. Like, like oh, I could have sworn. Let me use my other car. Oh, shit. <laughs> they both. <laughs> like, that. that's like what the experience is like. And I think, again, that's more the long-term um, implications of PR versus, you know, how we go back to all PR is good PR. It's still the yes and no. Right. And I I think it's easier to lean on that in the old media. It's a little bit more complicated in today's media. Mm. Right. When your YouTube page can be taken down, your IG page can be taken down. The bank can stop the money and say, we don't want to work with you. Right. You heard that Google Drive wasn't even letting people upload the Kanye drink champs interview. No. Yeah. Like people, you know, because they took it, took it off. They took it down. So people will be uploading on their Google Drives, apparently. It's a conspiracy. I haven't confirmed this, but I don't even want to say conspiracy, but this is something that I've, I've heard from a few different sources that aren't, like, horrible sources. Upload it, and they take it down. Yeah, that's crazy. Right? And then you got to remember, with Andrew Tate, his Uber account got yeah. <laughs> canceled. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, bro, they get your Uber, your DoorDash. They get everything. <laughs> right? That's the, Like, the tech stuff is different. Things have been, are, like, are very different today. So... Like there's a, a ebb and a flow and Kanye just happens to be at a certain level where there's a fighting chance for sure. Mm-hmm. Right. But again, that got established before this era was fully in place. It's I don't really see artists coming up in this era being able to do the same. No. All right. You have to be a lot more cognizant of of, you know, uh, how, your relationships with these specific communities and of course you don't have to i don't believe in pandering to every single community just so they can love you and all that type of stuff and oh i, I mentioned this statement or a song lyric and now i got to take it out my song and do that and i have like and you and it's really because you misconstrue my words or yeah. i mean like i don't believe in getting in all that stuff but you still got to be cognizant right yeah. and be aware and when you look at kanye's situation it's so funny because that entire thing was like a temperature check, not only from his side, but even the Jewish community side. And, you know, a lot of people were like, Kanye is trying to show people that my like, Jewish people get treated differently than black people because they didn't cancel him when he said this remark, when he said the Joy Flo- George Floyd thing, but they are now canceling him for making these remarks against Jewish people. I'm like, I, I don't really think that he's trying to show people that. Do we yeah. really like, you know, like I think he just fucked up twice and then he fucked up in the wrong order because that's part of why the black people weren't, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean, weren't backing him. Yeah. All right. So uh, it's like, now nah, you can't just go play some gospel and get us on your side this time, buddy. All right. So it's it's really interesting. I know there's people and people be people who support all any um him regardless, right? There's gonna be some people who Support him because. Look, there are going to be some people who support him because. Yep. And, you know, to me, there's also the sheep, right, who are just, no matter what any of these people do, y'all idolize them so much, you can't separate yourself and uh, this person's always misunderstood because you can always throw that meaning in. Oh, you just don't understand. You just Mm -hmm. don't understand. You just don't understand. But the funny part, though, like you said, support because. If you're at that scale... No matter what you do, there's always going to be a crowd that loves and hates you. Mm-hmm. At one point of time, Democrats basically loved Kanye. One time he was pretty much like, he just wasn't in politics, so he had both sides, right? Because mm-hmm. his music was so good and he was so big. Then there were some Democratic lean things, especially with the George Bush doesn't uh, love, like black people, care about black people, and then some other things he had did throughout the years. But then he started saying things the Democrats hate, and then the Republicans love him more for it. Mm. Everything gets politicized these days and artists aren't trying to be, a lot of artists are not trying to be political, but your statements will be (laughs) politicized, especially if done at the right scale. Like these people will like stop at nothing to figure out how to flip it towards their agenda. And that I don't think the artist community is yet ready for. No, they're 100% not. Uh, It's 100% not. It's such a weird space to be in. Um, but then, look, hey, you look at the 
side of the Jewish community, right? I think it's funny enough, what they tried to say Kanye was trying to do, the Kyrie situation actually did it more. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> In terms of like bringing black people, not to awareness, because that's a funny thing. Like a lot of the stuff Kanye says is like, sometimes it sounds like he just heard it. And like, yo, he's like educating y'all. You can tell it's like, bro, you just hear this shit, bro. Like, I learned this shit in sixth grade. But like, the Kyrie situation became interesting because it's another misstep, and it was on the Jewish community this time, right? Where you're not reading the room because Kyrie is the reverse. He had withdrew, 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 withdrew. And not because he was saying something specific about other cultures, but flat earth, right? Like he was saying like certain conspiracy theories <laughs> and statements where people were just like, man, I don't know about you, bro. Like you wow. So when he made that, like he shared the movie and, you know, made the statement that he did just, and when he shared it, people were basically looking at him like, bro, again, like you just <laughs> you know what I mean like black people weren't they're like bro this fool man you kind of like just chill dog like why we, we, we're we still not even over the flat earth you know that's lingering so that's where he was so nobody was giving any pushback to the repercussions he was facing yeah yeah and they mar martyred him they, and then yes they martyred him they, <laughs> they start going whoa 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 too far hmm. It's so like, wait, you got these lists of demands and now it feels like being bullied. And then mm -hmm. we have to look at it like, well, are you trying to make an example of us? And there's many people that feel like, um, you know, we're always the ones that get made an example of. Mm -hmm. It's like all these people do all these things, but y'all are really making an example of us. All right. Some people are like, oh, well, the Epstein didn't get looked at so bad. And we know all the horrible stuff he did. This guy just made a statement. And, and really and the funny part about it, too, is like Kyrie is. I don't want to say innocent to the people who might feel like he like was truly harmful, but I mean, innocent in terms of intention, like there was no, like Kanye was like, I'm going to do something or, and, and even as sometimes saying like, yeah, I meant it. And I know it's racist. Kyrie it's coming from a completely different energy. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and if you know, Kyrie just like, it's stuff he really is just like kind of exploring. He's almost kind of like lost and he's trying to explore. And he, and he says some wild things in the process. Yeah. So it's like, so that's another thing. It's like, this dude's not even coming crazy. It's, you can't even come to Kanye's defense because he's pushing the throttle. Kyrie is just chilling. So it's like, you just hitting this dude standing there, right? Yeah. So like, it's, it's from an organizational standpoint. And then you look at it from an individual standpoint, how both sides, like we're always having to like read the room, but how do you do PR just enough? You know what I mean? It's like, how do I know how much I should respond to this thing without awakening the other side? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, everything's in my, everybody's on my side. Let me hurry up and cap. And well, you know, I don't want to say cap because some of these situations are like, you know, more sensitive, but like, how do I take advantage and, and get a win and then go home before the, the tides turn and I'm here too long and I become the villain? Yeah, that's right? why so many of them just shut up. Because like, once you're a person that, that's that big, nothing you say will not be offensive to somebody. Yes. It's impossible at that point. Like, when you're super niche and everybody in your fan base looks exactly the same, you know, acts the same way, dresses, talks the same way. Yeah, you have a lot more room to be, you know, I won't say offensive, but say edgy at times, right? Because sometimes they're not trying to be offensive. But as soon as your audience starts getting becoming a mix and mingle of other audiences, there's all, there's the, the every time you say something is another shot in the dark at offending somebody. Every time, yeah. you, even even how you move and how you, you know, sometimes people on social media get offended by artists like doing things a certain way or like going to certain places, right? So. That's why we see so many artists and celebrities of that caliber just shutting the fuck up all the time because yeah. they know, yo man, I could wake up today and do a live and that should be a news a news story. Ten minutes after I'm done, and I, I didn't even realize I was saying, you know, what I'm saying was doing what I was doing or saying what I was saying or I didn't mean it that way, right? Like I was just joking right. with the people that get that, but because I'm so big and so many people are watching me from outside my community, I it, it now has a chance to go over to that space and then be looked at in a different way. So like. I don't think there is a such thing as a perfect 
PR strategy when you're a big artist. Like, you know, you can say things a certain way and, you know, have your, your copywriter write these crystal clear statements. But even then, sometimes those are offensive to the people that support you because they, they're looking at like, man, we listen to you speak. You know what I'm saying? We watch you in certain things. You don't talk like this. You were, you were, you were, this isn't what I thought you would have said mm-hmm. in this situation, right? Yeah. So you, it can be damaging to those. So it's just like, bro, at that level, you literally can't win unless you shut up. <laughs> I'll say this because it's like, I think the perfect example for me was when Lizzo and Beyonce both got in trouble for having spaz in their music. Mm, yeah like i was literally confused because i saw like i was reading the article and it was like sp asterisk actress z i'm like what kind of curse word is this like (laughs) i'm trying to figure out what the hell said and then when i finally found like what was said (laughs) i was like what like they coming at people for anything and the reason i have a a problem, right? I don't, I'm not against them for taking it out and all that stuff, but also the issue that I feel, because I feel like it's a very slippery slope, knowing that both of these two people are black, mm-hmm. right? And the reason and context that they were using, I know the context they were using it in, right? Which is the typical black context that I knew of it always. Mm-hmm. So like, there's nothing negative about it. It was almost there. Us almost like we're flexing and we're being positive, right? Mm. And we're completely unaware that somebody is using it, and we don't. We don't even know this negative context exists, right? Yeah. So it's like now you're apologizing just because you hurt something, somebody when you were actually doing something that's positive in your community and your space. And why that becomes slippery and such a weird place to be is you begin to strip people of how they the inside in the internal languages within their communities yes right yeah because you're trying to be this homogenous thing that can please everybody which we already know is impossible and when we have this access more and more people right are now seeing us and like you said somebody's going to be offended right and it's different parts of the world. Different words mean different things. But mm-hmm. like, so it's like, man, I didn't know. I mean, it does suck that this is an offensive word where you're from. I get it. You should know that I don't mean that. This is what I mean. And it only means this from where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Right? At some point, I feel like somebody has to get with that. Not with just words. Some of these things that happen. Because otherwise, it's like, where does it end? You know? Like, where does it end? Do we cancel? Do we limit all of the artists and everything that they can do, right? Um, or do we just go down this ever-evolving path of like super, super niche till you find that one community where somehow everything you believe and do, <laughs> <laughs> they actually believe and do, which I don't think is like, I don't think that's realistic. Yeah. But it's not realistic. Are you familiar with Black Rifle Coffee? Yeah, I said, yes. Wait, why are you smiling? Are you you had some? Yeah, I haven't had some before because uh, <laughs> Sam used to have this one apartment, uh-huh. and, uh huh, and somebody in his apartment complex had had a delivery to them, but accidentally had it sent to his apartment complex. He was like, I don't want this racist ass coffee. I was about to say, that's ironic knowing yeah. how, how Sam is, like, them of all brands. That's funny. He's like, I don't want this racist ass coffee. I was like, well, you know, coffee's coffee. <laughs> I think it's still the house. Yo, bro, this is so funny because <laughs> <laughs> it's like the way black people treat racism versus white people. It's like they don't like us, but we still, hey, a lick is a lick, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yo, this still free coffee. Let me take that. Like, I didn't spend any money. Hey. I didn't support them. Nobody's going to know I got this but you. Well, I, well, I mean, I guess I now. appreciate your virtue, but <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. And it's actually pretty terrible coffee. Okay. Yeah, it's not it's not good. I haven't I have one it's like in these cure cups. I have one. It was, uh-huh. it was trash. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well that's hey, not a not a good uh review. <laughs> but I haven't had the coffee y'all. I'm like, I you know, I don't really drink coffee like that. And I don't I didn't bring it up due to like racism because I didn't know enough about them to call them like racist or anything like that. I just know that they're for a specific brand. Yeah. Right. And the only reason I know that is because there was apparently 
something happened socially. I think there was like a guy, one, there was a guy that um, shot like some protesters, right? Mm. And maybe it was like, it was, I think it was during the BLM protest or something like that. And <sighs> apparently the founder of Black Rifle Coffee spoke out against it, right? And his base did not like that. His users, right? Apparently lost money or a lot of the brand ta or ta attacked them. And over time, maybe he had to retract and he kind of like had to do a shift, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, I was watching a quick interview with him on Joe Rogan podcast, like a clip, I think. And to me, beyond what they stand for, because really I don't know enough. Like it's funny that you said, <laughs> like you said, Sam said racist coffee. Like I, I really don't <laughs> didn't know that much. Yeah, I know nothing about all it. I <laughs> see, exactly. <laughs> all I knew is enough. And the, the point that I, I wanted to make was like you now have a coffee brand built around belief systems. Mm -hmm. And that's the era we're in where people don't actually give a fuck about product quality anymore. They just want to be around something that they also believe. Support, yeah. drink, eat, sleep, yeah. shit, listen to stuff that they believe. They want every aspect of their life to represent what they what they represent. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> and the crazy part about that though, like before, <sighs> I would have thought about that in a positive way. Like it's like everything around me represents who I am, right? Mm -hmm. More of a dreamer's way of doing things and manifesting but now it's like this negative slant on that because of the polarization of society because it doesn't seem just hey everything around me i want to manifest what i believe and like have these things that represent me it seems more so like an against thing as well mm. like i because i represent this i don't represent that mm. and why that's so interesting is because it still relates to artists right what do you believe what are you willing to put out there or like you said are you willing to just shut up yeah because we know the tweets are out there you know we know the posts are out there you do shit you, you go places we, we know you do shit and go places <laughs> you know like so like and navigating that junk as an artist is i don't it's just this world that artists are not being prepared for and the the ones who just want to kind of like stay the music and get their streams and live a really really low key life, cool. But the ones who really want to make that money out of it and they have to become a brand in some form or facet and speak to their audience, and I don't even mean super top tier speak to your audience and you're making hundreds of millions or millions or whatever. I mean like even you're just strong within a niche. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You're you're not even that big, but you're a, a representative of that niche, and that niche has a lot of core values. And you think about those core values, like, oh yeah, we all like love weed, like it's more playful and things like that, or we all love meditation. But now, are you Democrat or Republican? Right? Do you believe in abortion or not? Like all yeah. these like other issues have become more meaningful than it than it really should in my opinion in terms of because again it's like y'all aren't y'all everybody's ignoring the product or like the product becomes secondary yeah it's like what does a product represent that as a marketer it's like hey, it's beautiful for me like yeah. understanding how to get into people's mind but as an artist it's like bruh <laughs> yeah but i also think too it's, it's one of those things that they have to start figuring out how to prepare for because i don't even think every artist goes into it necessarily saying like hey this is what i want to represent i think fans just get naturally curious about those types of things over yeah. time and they ask you that which yeah. then forces you to put that information into the world right like a fan might ask you hey you republican or democrat they say you on the instagram like you're like oh yeah man i'm democrat or whatever whatever right just like that you offend it or you you disregard your Republican side of fan base. You didn't mean to do that. You didn't plan to put it out there and, and make it happen, but it happened, right? Because of the natural curiosity of your fan base. Mm -hmm. And so then you're put in a situation to where what, you don't answer, you don't respond, right? You brush them off, you kind of make them feel mm -hmm. cold and like you're not being a human towards them, which could still run some people off, right? So there's risk in all of it. There's yeah. a risk in opening that side of yourself up. There's risk in closing that side of yourself off. I think it becomes about like, which risk are you are you prepared to deal with? 
you know, are you prepared to deal with your fans? Saying like, oh, bro, he's cold. Like, he don't even talk to his fans like that. You're like, fuck it. I don't talk to my fans like that. So I don't, <laughs> I don't care if you think that, right? Then go that route, right? If you're like, yeah. I don't even fuck if they care what I am or what I think or whatever, whatever, then it's like, go for it, bro. But uh, all artists aren't built like that. Like, I know a lot of artists who would crack at the, the, the slightest fan pushback on their beliefs and things they think. Easy. Um, but like you said, they're not being trained for it. It's something that really is hard to be built into because like we said earlier, you only see that level of of um like outrage when you're a big artist. Right. Like people can be offended when you do it as a smaller artist, but your your career isn't gonna be affected. You know, if you're an artist with a hundred thousand monthly listeners and you know, you get caught out for making anti Semitic statements. Like you gonna be okay, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you're not. I don't know about that. Well, maybe not that. Yeah, right. Yeah. But okay, right. Actually, <laughs> no, but, you know, don't, don't, don't say that. But what is, but it's like, like you, you're more than likely gonna be okay than the, the bigger artists saying it because at that point, yeah, for sure, there's so much attention around them, and and you know what I'm saying they can't. It's hard for them to, to backtrack and build out of it versus like a smaller artist. You could say do some things, and then three years later, nobody remembers. Maybe starts getting pulled back up, but like the people that are coming along don't remember it. So it's like. The part that sucks though is people still will. You have people who are seeing you and learning about you that aren't maybe your fans yet. Yeah, and you and there will still be some people who leave you, and because of that, all right. Because and the and the reason is we're so polarized. We've eliminated nuance. So if you believe this, X Y Z, you also believe all those other things. Mm -hmm. It's like well. I like money and I like people, right? Yeah. Like they're not mutually exclusive, right? I, maybe I, I believe in this thing and this thing and that thing, but I don't believe in that. But if I drink Black Rifle coffee, apparently I'm racist, right? I don't know that. You know, I, I'm up here just sipping, having a good day. Oh, oh they got a free shirt that came with it. <laughs> you know, so people looking at me like Uncle Tom or something. I'm like, damn, I didn't know that. I just like free shit. You know, like <laughs> technically that would have been you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, bro. I had that shit tucked under my arm under the car because I didn't know. But when Sam says, "You know, I'm gonna believe him and like keep this out of sight, just in case, yeah, just in just, case, <laughs> just in case." I don't want these implications. Like, even if I look him up and I agree with him, whatever, I don't even know yet, so I don't even want to like bring him my way. Cause look, hey, next thing you know, Jacory, you trying to come out with the. uh I don't know the accessories for the locks or whatever. Got a holistic black brand, and then they pull out <laughs> that picture. <laughs> well, <laughs> you with the <laughs> drinking the coffee, sipping. <laughs> I remember I was texting Sam. I was like, "Man, I ain't gonna lie, man. I, I can't, I can't tell you what more about I would have had if I liked it. If this shit was delicious, hey, hey, bro." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you get to put some special instructions on that delivery. Take off the labels. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, man. We don't <laughs> even live over there anymore. Or so. Live it, <laughs> leave it next door, and then text me, and then I'll go pick it up from. <laughs> right, and it was such a big box, bro. It was like yeah. a box of like fifty something. I didn't know you could buy uh, Keurig, yeah. like that many Keurig cups of coffee at once, bro. It's like, damn, they really they got the biggest supporter package they can get. See, and that this is exactly like what I'm saying though. <laughs> it, we are in place where. You know, maybe there's also different taste buds, but let's just say it's a bad product and people buying it out the this shit's uh, trash. Hey, just because they <laughs> believe, right? So, again, as an artist and shoot content creator, business person, period. Today, like, it, like and that's the crazy part about it because of social media, and then you add where politics is taking everything, which a lot of times is has been to do to social media too. All these people are being put in one pot. Like yeah. the artist is a content creator and is playing politics. Like you're doing all of it, whether you want to or not. Like that's just the the era that we're living in. And we're gonna see what that creates, you know, <laughs> like ten years from now. But it's I know it's really uncomfortable for people. But if we bring it back to Kanye, can you survive it at that level? At that level, I think so. I 100% think too. Yeah. Um, so, but, like, we're on the same page. Like, people yeah. forget. That's the crazy part about it. People just forget. Yeah. That part alone. And especially with music, bro, all it takes is one good song or project and you back in the game. It's all it takes, bro. It's, it's sad to say. It's a terrible It's a terrible truth of music, but that's all it takes, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, but I think it's interesting because I do think 
you know, it might be five years, ten years, whatever. Like, but I, you know, I don't think he's through yet from having commercial level of attention mm. and level of success in some things. But I saw somebody say, "Oh, yeah, this is all planned from a standpoint of trying to get out the deals," like you referenced earlier. I can see that. That's a strategy. We've seen that done before. People go crazy to get out their deals. Cool. My problem or the thing that I would find interesting in, with that is, one, I don't know. It seems like there could have been a better way to do it. Yeah, probably. Like, two, going in, there was, like, people that were kind of advising against it anyway. Should include his sway, yeah. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. I mean, he came out of the Nike deal, right? So you already went through that type of experience. And if he wants to do something at the level of scale that he likes to do stuff at, you're still going to run into the same problem. Like if you go build it and this is yours, right? Ultimately, as you level up at some point, you're still going to hit like you're in the billions of dollars. You're still going to have to work with these types of people like who are in different spaces or have, you know, suppliers, whatever, in some way. Yeah. So like you got to learn how to function. It seems like, I don't know. He just doesn't bid well when it comes to, <laughs> I don't know. I guess my way or the highway. Let's put it that way. Yeah, man. It That's feels, what it seems like. Yeah. It feels like, you know, he probably wants the small niche team, you know, the, the ninja assassin team, but he had worked this up into the, the big army, you know. Exactly. And so he's like, I'm going to just exactly. torch the whole battlefield and start back over right. with what I want to start with. It's yeah. like you're trying to move that way. And I think he likes that level of control and, and nimbleness and approach. But some of it doesn't work on that scale. Yeah, it feels like he wants the control of a niche team but the resources of a major corporation. Yes. Yeah. He always goes for those resources. That's why he does the partnerships and then he, he likes to go for the best of the best, which I get it, the appreciation that your vision is you plus the best. This has to be amazing, right? Mm -hmm. But business says, hey, we're best, remember? So we don't need you. Mm -hmm. Like, we need you for your vision. You know, you convince your people that this is the next cool thing with marketing, but we also know trends come. Our business has been around for this period of time and it's still going to be around. People can say, oh, we lost $2 billion or whatever. But no, actually, we're straight, right? Like, all, especially a lot of this stuff is just paper. It's paper money moving around, all right? It's a moment in time. It's a motion, so stock drops, but assets haven't changed. So the, the real value of the business has not changed. Um, so it's... It's interesting when you see this, I don't know, Kanye with these moves, man. Because, yeah, I just fear like seeing him build something back up, get to that level again, and then still finding the same issue, knocking heads. Oh, no, he's 100%. He has a long career of doing it, bro. Like, every every <laughs> couple of years he does it, you know? So, he's 100% going to do it again. We don't. We just don't know who is going to be the community that gets you know, attack next or, or came after next, but yeah. he's definitely gonna do it. This is I had a one of my uh live streams where I was talking about how uh, emotional manipulation is such a big part of Kanye's marketing rollout. Like he's great at it. Like he's really great. good at it. And so I remember there was this I don't remember if it was a video I watched or a book I read or something, but I remember like really early in being a marketer, I read this thing that was talking about like, yo, the you know, the best emotional triggers to get people to respond to your marketing. Or happiness, um, what is it? Happiness, sadness, and outrage. Like if you can make people laugh and be really happy, they'll remember you. If you can make people be really sad around something, go pull really sad memories out of them, they'll always remember you. And if you can make people mad as fuck, they'll always remember you. Mm -hmm. Because if you can, if you can find a way to trigger those three emotions in people, you're a great marketer. You're gonna do it. And so it's like Kanye is really good at going after outrage, right? He knows yep. people. Rem people remember what they're angry at. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. people remember what makes them mad. Way more than they remember things that made them feel nice. Like, oh, I don't really have an opinion on that. I don't care. I forget about it. Oh, no, I hate that he said that. Now yeah. I'm thinking about this shit all day, every day, right? And so he's had, like, we've literally watched him sharpen that skill throughout the years. Like I said, the George Bush thing was the first thing. <laughs> it, was, it was crude, right? It was yeah. probably the first time he was pulling that strategy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And he saw what it did for him. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. He saw that. He saw he had a, the Taylor Swift thing, bro. The Taylor Swift thing, to me, was the closest instance, I think, that he truly came to maybe being out of here. Because that shit tanked him. You know yeah. what I'm saying? When he survived that shit, 
imagine surviving that as young Kanye West at the time going up against yeah. Tulsa, bro. There's no way you don't walk around the world thinking you're not you're inv- you're not invincible. Yeah, I survived George Bush backlash and Taylor Swift backlash. Why would I think that any other community of people can bring me down? <laughs> and, and see, and that's why you gotta be careful, right? Like, hey, he, I'm doing the same thing I always done. What's the problem? Like, the don't work today. He's like, you were supporting them back then. Well, like, he's like, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. That is interesting. Tr- triggering those emotions because it's all about making an impression, right? Mm-hmm. We know. That in between, bro, like being warm, it just doesn't do it for you. That's why we're caught in this era of again, because we're it's so much attention. We have to shout louder and louder. Mm-hmm. We have to have a greater and greater clickbait title. We have to say a more outrageous statement. We have to, um, like pick more of a side if we really want like some strong, strong support. Mm-hmm. Right and. I don't want to say, I'll just say doing some reading, there was a, I remember reading that when you're trying to start a movement, you have to go to the extreme because you have people who are indifferent or they're weak in their belief. And when you're trying to start something new, especially if it's going to create a bit of an uproar, those weak people will weaken the movement. Mm -hmm. They don't believe strong enough. So you have to be saying stuff so crazy, basically, that only the crazy people (laughs) are left. (laughs) And then you move from there. Yeah. Right. And it's funny because there's also a story in the Bible that reflects that same idea. I can't remember the exact numbers, but, and I can't even remember Buddy's name. So, you know, all my Bible readers, please share. But he has, he it was a guy who had an army. Let's just say he had 30K people going against an army that was bigger than 30K. All right. But then God told him, hey, yo, get rid of some of these folks because they don't believe like that they can win. He was up, let me, got rid of them. Got rid of some more people because they didn't really believe. Got rid of some more people because they didn't really believe. And I, they took it down. Let's just say they went from 30K to 5K. And they only had people that really believed going against this army that was already bigger than them in the first place. But they won. Mm. Right? Because they had strong belief, zero doubt. Right? And we know in all things, like moving with confidence, execution, zero doubt, there's a massive superpower in that. Yeah. Right? What that unlocks, especially then you know your team is all moving in concert. So it's funny how that reflects in all spaces and that same thing reflects in the movement. The problem is the space that we're in (laughs) having to, and when we're fighting for attention and people naturally like adjusting to the climate saying, hey, I still want to be seen. What do I have to do? I got to have a greater clickbait title. Like we know, oh, sure, you can drop a video on YouTube, TikTok. We have to have titles just for it to get seen. So some people come in and they're like, oh, man, this is wrong or this is clickbait. or And they're disagreeing with the title that it came in. It's like, well, hey, listen to what the hell we're actually saying. Yeah. All right, Because a lot of times we might not be saying exactly what it might look like from the headline. But that's a part of what you have to do. These You have to do it on these platforms to get attention. So imagine being an artist, right? or just any kind of public figure trying to navigate that, not from the standpoint of trying to stay out of trouble, because that's one thing, that's a good thing, but shoot, I'm trying to make a splash. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to make a splash and be careful at the same time. (laughs) This is impossible, it's an oxymoron. Hey, bro, (laughs) it it, it is a fucking dilemma (laughs) that (laughs) we are all in, but especially you artists who are trying to be that big. Um, So, I mean, with that being said, uh, you know, I think we could close this topic up, but we we definitely, I feel like there's other angles and things like that we can unpack in this space because I don't really ever hear anybody talk about this type of thing as it relates to artists. But I, like I said, I, increasingly, artist, content creator, politicians, like it's, it's all like coming into one, mm-hmm. like, Bro, like literally, okay, you got Trump as a president. They're talking about Dwayne Rock Johnson possibly running as a president. You or people wanting him to run as a president. Like, 
like the politicians are a different type of celebrity these days. You know what I mean? You got Stacey Abrams pulling up to one music fest and <laughs> like, you know, pulling up to like Morehouse and uh, well, uh, AC homecoming. Like all of these things are like just mushing together and, you know, it's almost like music is your way in, but once you're in, now everybody's playing the same game. Mm-hmm. It's just like that's your home base. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's all it is. The game of attention. Game of attention, man. Yeah. The game of attention. And you even fighting your fans for it these days. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, bro. Your fans like, shoot, I just got a million views, bro. You only got 500,000. You fell off, I'm man. Saying, well, I'm better than you, bro. <laughs> you should be giving me tickets to your show <laughs> so I can do a post. <laughs> Actually, that's a tattoo shit, right? Uh, People yeah, are literally yeah. thinking that. Like, hey, bro, I got more. I, like, we're looking at the same scoreboard, and technically, I got higher I engagement. Am beating you right now. I am beating you right <laughs> now. I like your music, but I'm beating you. Whew. Crazy ass environment. Um, <laughs> but well, we're not gonna even get into this topic as a whole, man, and go deep into this this topic. We're gonna make this the last topic, and I'm gonna just turn it into a question. Twenty One Savage says Nas isn't relevant. Is he relevant? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you just tried to set me up. <laughs> you just tried to set me up. <laughs> See, luckily I have my Wheaties this morning. I'm on my P's and Q's. I'm sharp. But yeah, Nas is relevant, bro. I think... <laughs> I feel like what 21 Savage was trying to say is that he's not relevant to a mainstream mm-hmm. music audience mm-hmm. or a young audience because mainstream music audience culture I think tends to be intertwined with like young music culture pretty much right so when we think of relevant we think of what's relevant between um you know teenagers like younger 20 year olds and things but that was one of the people in the clubhouse talk with 21 savage said that and he was like you know i'm 40 years old but i still do shit i still pay attention i still spend money you saying that i'm not relevant because i'm not fucking 19 or whatever he said right and i was like that's actually a good point you know what i'm saying like, that's, yeah. a, that's a great point yeah you can be relevant in different spaces it's no different than, but you know how many times we've had labels reach out to us, or maybe I'm just doing research on Spotify. Not I, I cl- click on the artist. Oh, they want us to work with this, you know, indie pop electro artist or some shit. I don't listen mm-hmm. to that, right? I'm like, oh, let me check this guy out. Go click on him. Like, damn, we got 30 million monthly listeners. Like, you go look at the Instagram. Like, damn, bro, he got 25 million followers and right. shit, bro. Like, he don't been on this and this and this. You're like, bro, I've never heard of this person before. If you asked yeah. me five minutes ago who this person was, I'm like, he must not be relevant because I ain't never seen him before. Yeah. It goes back to the whole thing of your bubble is your bubble. That's it. Right. And That's what's it. relevant in your bubble may not necessarily be relevant in other people's bubble. Just like you said about the Kanye thing. There are people in parts of the world where they will say, Kanye okay, ain't relevant here. We don't, we don't care about him. We don't know about him. Now, this person, this person is what's, who's high. And you'd be like, who the fuck is that? You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, who is this person? So, yeah. I think that is the conversation that needs to be explored. Is like, what are the parameters of relevancy? Who mm-hmm. and, and does do those parameters change based on which group of demographic of people we're talking to or talking about? Because I think the answer is yes. No? I agree with that. And I think that was a well... Well placed answer. <laughs> I consider the circumstances, the recovery, the the landing was stuck. That was beautiful, bro. Thank you, man. Thank you. That was I've been practicing. <laughs> Putting me in the game, coach, bro. Like, hey, Jacory got you. That the only thing I'll say to that is I agree with everything you said, and to me, it's just symbolic of one: your bubble is your bubble, and not seeing beyond it. Mm. And the people who tend to violate that the worst are younger people. Yeah, hundred percent, bro. You just don't have enough experience to know how much you don't matter. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good way to look at it, bro. You don't have enough experience to know how little you matter. Hey, that's bro. so fucked up. It's so true. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sucks, bro. Hey, it just is what it is. Bro. Or the, enough experience to realize you haven't experienced anything yet. That too. Yeah, bro, because that's my least favorite comment on the internet. Oh, who's this guy? I never heard him before. It's like, bro, there's so many things. In people. You're, you're 17. There's so many things right. you haven't heard of yet, bro. Exactly. You just learned about soup for the first time. Right. This type of soup for the first time a week ago. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you think I'm trusting your opinion? The worst part is when people do that. <laughs> when, imagine, imagine I'm walking down the street and I hear, ah, I'm like, what's going on? 
It's crazy. Next thing you know, I hear, ah, I'm like, man, should I check that out? They're like, yeah, bro, come on, let's let's go check that out. That's crazy. It gets louder. Yeah, 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 yeah. I walk over. There's this opening in the parking lot. People dancing. They going crazy. There's a guy standing on the car, and he's singing, rapping. Everybody's just giving him all the attention in the world, showing him all the love. And then I go, yo. Who's this guy? He ain't nobody. What's the big deal? It's like, because you don't know who he is. It's yeah. like, obviously, he's somebody, yeah. right? And it's one thing to be surprised that somebody somebody. Like you said, like 30 million streams, monthly listeners, like, like bro, somebody. What in the world? Like, yeah. I've been missing out. But there's literally people who are looking at somebody be somebody <laughs> and are still concluding that because I don't know you yet, <laughs> you aren't anybody. It's like, how does that add up? Yeah, bro. Like, cause and, and the reason I said that example is because what you were referring to, I know specifically, is like a comment on a video yeah. that already has a, like, <laughs> views and comments on it. <laughs> it's like, how are you saying this? <laughs> like, who are you? Nobody knows you. I like, mean, the other hundreds of people that commented, no, you no. just skipped over two. <laughs> I love you, appreciate you, and said nobody knows you. <laughs> like, yeah, bro. Yeah. So that that's that has to be the most. Over, uh, what's the one I'm looking for? Overplay, yeah. uh, this in music, bro. Nobody yeah. knows who you are. It's like, it's not true. Yeah. It's the internet, bro. Somebody knows who I am. Yeah, you know, it's, it's that one's usually <laughs> a more reflection of the people saying it. It's, it's funny. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, man, I said, I'm waiting to the end of the pod to say this. The show, technically, we don't even call it the pod. We, we a full blown show yep, in development. Yep. Um, but, Tuesdays and Thursdays, as a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said that on the front end. If you made it this far, that's extra, extra love. So I appreciate it. And um, hey, what can I say other than I'm Sean. I'm Corey. And we out. Peace. Peace.